Welcome to the Basin Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Steven Zuber. I am Jay Sticky. I don't have a clever intro for today. Well, then we'll just we're reminding people that we are starting with uh, the, the main sequence or the main subject rather than the sequences. Yeah. And let's let's dive right in. It looks All like right. we have some feedback too. Did you want to talk about that? Oh, let's do the quick feedback first, then we'll dive into the longer subject. Okay. Yeah. This was just blew my mind, so go for it. Uh, so this was actually, I think, a reply to the um, Monarchy Patrons Only episode that we had. So uh, if you aren't a patron, you don't know what we're talking about here. Um, although with the first 15 minutes, I did put up on, on this feed for everyone. But Emilio says, by the way, Singapore is in no way at all ethnically homogenous. I had thought that it was and was one of the things I said in that. Uh, Emilio says, they even have housing laws that state the dif- that the different ethnicities have to live close to each other so racial tensions don't form. So, huh. Okay. That's I, fascinating. Yeah. It's kind of surprising that that works to yeah. diffuse racial tension rather than make it like it must be like equally nice neighborhoods, right? Not necessarily. If the ethnic minorities can't afford very good stuff, then maybe not. Well, maybe they could, but they're not allowed to, right? I'm thinking like because everything for me doesn't relate to real life; it relates to nonsense. Uh, <laughs> in Windhelm and Skyrim, mm-hmm. the dark elves get this quarter of the city, yeah, and it's kind of slummy, mainly because Ulfric is a racist pig or shit pig, and so. Uh, I think that's the, how things just used to be in the past before but this we is, decided that racism sucks. But yeah, the I thing is, like Singapore doesn't bit. exist in you know 1590, does it? And it's <laughs> it's 2020 people, 2022 people. Yeah. We do still tend to have pockets of racial minorities. The you know. Oh, in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. but they're a, mostly self-chosen. Sort of. I mean, it's kind of the white flight phenomenon, and mm-hmm. again, like the shittier areas are what people who are of lower socioeconomic status can afford and so like i i actually just want to look up more about how this was set up because i'm also curious about whether like do they have subsidized housing like does it does it work is it diffusing racial tension or is it making it worse like i have so many questions from what i recall singapore had some really weird housing laws but all i remember now is that i thought they were really bizarre and i don't remember any of the details singapore is just weird in general yeah it is i feel like i want to visit sometime just definitely not bringing any chewing gum or <laughs> right. just kidding. I actually hate spray gum. paint, <laughs> but yeah, that's a, uh, that is interesting. And maybe we should look into how racial tensions are doing in Singapore at some point just for fun. Yeah. Every now and then I think like we should just do this, this show every single week because there's so many things to talk about and research, but then I'm all like, also, I don't know if there's enough time for all that. It's a time investment. Yeah. It takes more time to do these than it does just to record. So yeah. All right. Let's dive into, uh, the one of the main things we want to talk about here cool so like a year and a half ago we got an email this was a year and a half ago november 5th huh wait november 5th 2021 oh so, so that's half a, a year few ago. months ago never mind yeah, yeah, yeah i'm bad at years i feel less bad about it you said what chase <laughs> i said that's almost my birthday nice cool. november 6th no oh, mm-hmm. how fun um all right so they signed it steve that's 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 vague enough um well with like you know with emails it's more private chat if it's a comment i'll read the whole name right yeah anyway Steve, you wrote in asking about chronic stuff, and I don't know if I ever wrote back saying, this is awesome, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get to this eventually. Mm-hmm. I think I meant to and didn't, so... Uh, I was going, so now you get an episode. Now, now you get... Now you get a, yeah, we're all going to talk about it, so... Because we haven't talked about chronics in a while, and this is your annual reminder? Your yeah. periodic reminder that chronics is a great idea, and you should get signed up if you can. Totally. Um, so, apparently, there's a spreadsheet uh, on Less Wrong that I didn't know about. You can put in your own, like, estimates for the... Uh, likelihood of various things right and get get your number dump at the end and i didn't know about that so that we'll link to that that sounds cool what are some of these various est- estimated built thingies well let's see we've got things like you die suddenly in circumstances where you'd not be able to be frozen in time you die of something where the brain is degraded to death you die in a hospital that refuses access to you by the cryonics people um they're pretty long there's things like that but then they go further along of things like um, reviving people in a simulation is impossible no one is interested in running you in a simulation. It's too expensive to run you in a simulation. So so you make guesses as to what you think the likelihood of all those things are likely to be. Right. And then it spits out a number. Yeah. I'm assuming, you know, it's a long list. I'm assuming some of these are like the world ends or it's illegal to resurrect people or whatever. At least one of them was everybody dies. Right. Oh, there it is. Yeah. All people die. <laughs> <laughs> or like some random pizza guy <laughs> accidentally falls oh, in your cryotic <laughs> pod and... Competing business grabs all the heads and, you know, the truck thaws. Um, got to gotta consider that odds. Anyway, Steve came up with uh, odds of 1 in 125, which is a lot higher than he expected. Uh, but the error bars are, often, you know, huge. 
so the things that aren't addressed, uh, like that these weren't in the list, but are worth addressing, and he would like to know our opinions on what these things are exactly, or what these likelihoods are. And to be clear, we're not chronics experts; we're enthusiasts, yes, um, <laughs> and advocates, which you'd think you should be an expert in, but not necessarily. I guess I'm fine advocating for things I'm not an expert at. Yeah, yeah, All yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm not an expert in anything, but I advocate for some stuff. There you go. Uh, what if they come up with a quote, pretty good unquote method in 50 years? Do I get my brain unfrozen or wait another 50 years to get the good version? I have no control over that. That's interesting. Yeah. I let's mean, hit these one at a time, actually, rather than go through them. So let's, yes, let's pause absolutely. there. Yeah. I, I suspect, I, don't, I guess, you know, pretty good's in quotes there for a reason, mm-hmm. right? Like, if they, if they brought people back, or they, if they thawed brains out, and it was like, you know, they had a fourth of their original IQ, you know, I think that they would not do that after they tried once and fucked it up, right? Yeah. Also, um, I mean, I don't think they would try this on humans until they have it, uh, figured out what how bad it actually is pretty good won't won't suffice for human trials <laughs> i think for trials no yeah. but maybe i mean his question is what if like they get to a point where pretty good is actually pretty good and then uh like like he says i have no control over whether your brain gets unfrozen or not and i mean my idea is like yeah you don't i guess you kind of you hope that the future either has pretty good heuristics for when uh when they decide to reanimate you or uh, maybe they take the effort to look through things you wrote online maybe guess if you would want to be unfrozen sooner or rather than uh wait for a higher fidelity version maybe by the time you get frozen there might even be a ability to like write sort of a will thing i would like to get unfrozen in these circumstances and not in these yeah i was gonna ask you guys are actually signed up uh do they have i guess i guess not um do they have like anything that you sign that you know like for me, talks about your preferences about being unfrozen. For me, it's been so long, I don't remember. Uh, if I started getting into a position where I had a terminal disease, I would probably look into that and find some way to leave that behind. Um, I don't. I really don't recall if there was anything like that in the initial paperwork. I know there was for circumstances under which I want to be preserved. Okay. Um, but as far as unpreserved, I think I don't think there's anything like that in the initial paperwork that I signed ish years ago. Some of the circumstances. I think if memory serves, there was like four and it was, you know, preserve me, whatever you can at any, at any, at any cost, at any cost (laughs) or like any, any viability. Mm -hmm. (laughs) If you find your pinky and it's, that's what's left after you get thrown through, thrown through a wood chipper, put it in, put it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the boxes. Um, One was like only under ideal circumstances. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm in a hospital. You guys are right there. They call time of death. You pump me full of cryoprotectant. I think I checked the use your own best faith judgment Mm -hmm. box. Um, but as far as unfrozen, and there are at least two main companies in the U.S., Alcor and the Chronics Institute. Um, I know the Chronics, the Chronics Institute is not a big business. Um, you know, they, they have some many hundreds, I think, with many thousands more signed up mm-hmm. in preservation. But uh, every time I've called, I've talked directly to the president of the company. Yeah. And so I bet if you called Andy Zawaki and asked him, hey, I'm curious, what do you guys do for like the what, – what is your unthawing process – timeline look like might even be on their website right now i'm not sure mm-hmm. i maybe should have done some homework before looking into this <laughs> but chronics institute.org is the website uh we'll link to the url in case i got dot org or dot com or something confused but check the show notes for chronics chronic institute's website um yeah. but yeah i think that if you i would have to think that there's probably some way to have them sign a thing because you know you're they've got a record of you when you're there you're not just vat number 17 i imagine yeah. you could yeah. try to put it in your own will too like the real question is how much of this documentation survives into the future and how long will it survive? Because paperwork gets lost. Well, I mean, you could back it up on the cloud, I guess. Internet gets deleted. Then what's the, even the point of coming back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if there's no internet, you don't want to live. <laughs> just put that in your will. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if YouTube's gone, then just count me out, man. Mm-hmm. The thing I thought of, you know, if you get unfrozen... And then it turns out 50 years later, there's like a better process. I mean, I would hope that if the technology has advanced, like if, I don't know, if if they bring you back in kind of a shitty simulation, I imagine they could upgrade your simulation or if they bring you back, like, I don't know, but you're still in your like aged, you know, 80 year old body and like medicine advances that they could do regenerative medicine, you know, like, I think uh, if it, I suppose in the, I think I'd rather be, sorry, uh, be brought back sooner. And yeah. then later with like the expectation that even if it's kind of low fidelity or whatever, it could be improved. In the least convenient world, the um the 
revivification might not be a thing that you can do more than once. So they bring you back and then you're stuck with what you got because it was destructive to unfreeze yeah. you to the, from the source material. But I, I mean, I guess it really just depends on your personal opinion and what you would want. I think I would prefer having the extra 50 years to observe humanity, to reintegrate, to have less of a cultural shock, cultural lag between when I'm frozen and when I'm revived. I think I would prefer to have the 50 years as long as it's a, you know, pretty darn good simulacrum of me it doesn't have to be exactly as i am now because i'm not exactly as i was now 10 years ago well and consider like even like an edge case of that scenario where the river vacation that's a i'm gonna just jump around to the resurrection wake up revival because a lot of these are but i like river vacation that's that's fun yeah um <laughs> that sounds more scientific. <laughs> that's probably the correct term um the so if that process isn't destructive you know they, they could they could wake up the person and you could you could exist at eighty percent capacity or whatever for fifty years, and then they're like, oh look, we got the two version done. Do you want to do you want us to run that one on your brain, mm -hmm. um, the, that we still have, or you know you can you can decide, and maybe you could even merge the last fifty years with the new consciousness too, right? I was about to say yeah. that would be a big difference, yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot to consider there. As far as uh, um, well, actually, this is more for the next question. So or no, the one after that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, <laughs> what's the next question? All right. What if they come up with the perfect method, but I have no legal rights to my brain pattern? Someone could buy it and run a simulation that puts me through psychological tests or torture me if that's their thing. Um, I don't know what legal rights exist for brain patterns like that. I think... Right now, none. None, but I... Uh, I mean, so that's a possibility. You'd have to wonder why someone would bother. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, someone could do that to you now, mm -hmm. right? You just don't... You're not, in, you're not in emulation. You're just a person in a basement. Yeah. But I do know that at CI, because Cryonex Institute is a lot of syllables... Um, CI, many of the board members, if not all of them, have family and crowd preservation there. Mm -hmm. And so they're incentivized to lead the organization, organization in such a way where that doesn't happen. Right. Um, and that, you know, so they, they, don't, they don't want their parents or whatever to be woken up in torture factories. Um, I think this is of the same kind of um, question slash objection that you often hear when you sign up for Cryo or tell people about Cryo, which basically boils down to what if the future was evil? And I'd be... <laughs> That sucks. You know, I hope it's not evil. When when you sign up for cryo, your part of your risk assessment is, do I think the future would be evil? And if I do think the future would be evil, do I think they would have the motivation to unfreeze me specifically in order to be evil to me specifically? Which I think both of those are very rare. I think if we do end up with an evil future, they're not going to bother reviving brains. They'll have plenty of their own people to torture. But, They'd have uh, to really hate you in particular. <laughs> right? <laughs> maybe, maybe it turns out that I put out a podcast episode which 50 years later sparked a genocide and people are like Let, let's get that eniash guy and really torture him for this bullshit or this one where we call anyone who would ever wake up somebody who's in cryopreservation preservation and torture them we call we call them idiots <laughs> they're like i'll show you Stan. that's right um, yeah that that's you know that's not impossible yeah. I, I would say you know put that on your I'm, I'm sure that that was actually on the list the thing on less wrong here uh the list of bad outcomes one of these has to be the future is evil or no one's interested in your brain's information, which is like not an evil future, just kind of an epithetic one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. When I picture no one's interested in your brain's information, like I don't think the future will be interested in me in particular. But I imagine, you know, in the most callous way possible to put this, I, I give money. Actually, this sounds, I can, I can pat myself on the back and sound callous at the same time. Mm -hmm. I give money every month to uh, give well. And I think I put it in there, spend it as you need it bucket, but I think it's currently going towards malaria bed nets. Mm hmm. I don't know who I don't know or really care who I'm helping. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I imagine in the future there, there there could be a very similar circumstance where, mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think it'll. This is what I consider most likely, and I don't think that's just even optimism. You know, assuming things don't go catastrophically wrong in the in the next centuries, you know, we'll have more people with with some level of of uh, financial comfort who want to help people. Like mm -hmm. that. That's just a trend that's been happening you know, over the last century, mm -hmm. and so they'll be like, oh, one of the things we're putting, you know, our charity dollars towards is a uh, cryonics um, revival. Yeah. And like, they're not going to look up who they're helping. You know, it's maybe, maybe it will be like, you know, the, the Oxfam things where they send you a postcard of the kid that you're sending to school. Yeah. Hey, here's, here's <laughs> Steven. You woke him up. Thanks. <laughs> you a double, th double thumbs up. And they're uh, like, why is he flipping me off with his thumbs? <laughs> it's like, no, no. In that century, we meant a different thing. God, that'd be awesome. Um, I kind of imagine maybe a scenario where, there's limited resources to bring people back and they will want to prioritize like, I don't know, great leaders or genius scientists or something, but it's still kind of like 
you don't end up getting woken up first is fine. Or maybe if you're just not woken up at all, it's kind of like neutral outcome. Yeah. The thing that the main loss there would be the money that you spent before you died that you could have spent on other stuff instead rather than the uh, freezing insurance. But I, I'm willing to spend that money because I already, you know, think there's a low chance of getting unfrozen if I do get frozen. The My speculation on what would happen to get people unfrozen is though uh, either, like Steven said, a very rich future where people just have the extra money to help others and this is an altruistic thing you can do to help others. Uh, the other option I, I think may be uh, likely is just a few people get unfrozen here and there, either for historic interest or because, yeah, it was someone that was... I don't know, some way influential and they would want to, you know, talk to them just for posterity. Like, holy shit, we got Shakespeare here. Let's let's unfree Shakespeare and see what he has to say. If Elon Musk gets frozen, they're going to wake him up just to talk to him, right? Totes, yeah. yeah. And then uh, I personally, if I ever get unfrozen, am going to do uh, some work to either start a charity or work for a charity or contribute towards a charity, which gets more people unfrozen because that was me. I want to help out other people like me. Uh, I'm hoping that at least one of the people that gets unfrozen for actual interest by that society will then go on to put some effort into getting everybody else unfrozen as a sort of, you know, you you kind of have a more instinctive urge to help people who are like you or who are in a situation that were like you were. A lot of people, when they make it, will go back and will fund schools in their home district or do other things that help people that were similar to them. Like I was... What really saved me during my adolescent was having these geckos, and so I'm now funding a gecko <laughs> charity that distributes geckos to poor people, so maybe mm -hmm. they can be helped through their hard times too, you know? Don't don't do the 2K geckos, though. The what? <laughs> I just got a 2K gecko. Uh, I was showing a video to these guys before. They're, yeah. they're little demons. <laughs> nipped. But, I got nipped. <laughs> I should have mentioned that the one that I have is a baby. They're, she's going to get three times that size. Nice. Oh, man. So those bites might actually break skin. Oh yeah, no, they can they can do some damage as an adult, but she'll be tamed by that point. Cool. To totally. Teacher lesson. <laughs> Bite her back. Show dominance. Um, so it's interesting. This 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 actually ties into so like if uh, first of all, hearing that you actually have like you know you said if I get woken up, this is one of my plans. Hmm. I've never had in my own head like any anything approaching a hard plan of like what would happen if I'm if I'm uh, woken up after being cryopreserved. preserved, and that's actually. Like a rather like transcendental state of mind sort of thought. It'd be hard that's, to that's awesome think about though, like. But that's because you don't know the circumstances. But it's vague enough that like, if but, yeah. possible, I'm going to help more people wake up. Like that's that's actually really really cool. And uh, I'm, yeah, I like that. We're right there with you. That that's great. Um, Sweet. Yeah. So I think that um, you know it. You you can't rule out the possibility that you know mad scientists could get your. Uh, um, your brain scan or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that that's a risk to put on the on the list of cons, or you know, on on, on that's a list to put on on your in your long calculus of is this worth it? But you also can't rule out the possibility that you're going to be woken up in a future full of beautiful women, and they really need some males. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's... as long as we're thinking about crazy futures that might theoretically happen. Yeah, no, why not? Could be like the super happies, you know. Yeah, um... you wake up and just everything's ice cream. <laughs> Your ice cream, everything. Oh man, pets, that'd be dangerous. TV. I might start eating myself. Lick. Um, <laughs> then licking the inside of your elbow wouldn't be so, so, so boring. There wasn't. What? Oh my god. There was... <laughs> so there worth was... a candle reference. Yeah, there was a Simpsons episode where Homer had his head turned into a donut and he kept eating it himself. <laughs> there was remember that X body spray commercial where like the dude it was like chocolate scented. And he, this dude on a bus sprays himself, and he turns into chocolate, and then all these hot chicks come over and start eating him, and he's just smiling. Nice. It was so disturbing. I hate things <laughs> that smell like food that you aren't supposed to eat. I know. Especially when you put them on your lips. I'm talking about chapstick. I like the flavor of chapsticks. But like, you can't eat them. But you, you want to. The what? You can lick your lips, and it tastes good. But then you're going to eat some of the chapstick when you lick your lips. It's not bad to eat it. <sighs> it can't... My, my reasoning is that... It, I mean, it's probably bad to eat tube after tube, but, right, yeah. but eating, you know microscopic amounts when you lick your lips like they wouldn't give you something to put on your mouth that's poisonous yeah yeah maybe Still seems mean or, maybe. or making like tasty flavored toothpaste again <laughs> just mean yeah it's like just giving a dog like a, a tasty steak and rubbing it in his face and be like oh no steak for you <laughs> <laughs> enjoy the smell yeah uh, anyways let's move on let's keep going we've yeah. got uh so, uh, I may be put in a safe, comfortable simulation environment, but anything beyond sitting on a porch sipping lemonade costs extra, and I have no way to pay. We could hypothesize some sort of work in a, simu a simulation can do to earn money, but that seems like stretching things. I love this point, and I want to hit it in two different ways. Um, 
this would also fall into the charity bucket, mm-hmm. right? If uh, if Elon Musk gets woken up in the future and the first thing he does is make something that makes a ton of money and starts throwing it at more chronic people, or fuck it, if Inyash does that, <laughs> right. why am I hypothesizing Elon? Um, if you make a fortune, you're not going to just like stop at everyone sitting on their simulated porch, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to like make sure they have good, fulfilling lives if, if give, given all the power that we can. So um, one thing is that charity could do it. Another thing is that... Uh, I don't know if we're being brought back in a simulation. We'll put a pin in that because that wasn't one of my main two points. The other two points came from uh, Rudy Hoffman is the main guy that uh, does uh, life insurance agency or uh, life insurance contracts with Chronics Institute. Um, he works for Kansas City Life and actually just like apparently crushes it there. He's been getting awards for how well he does. Awesome. But he is the he's also a big advocate for Chronics. He's written two books, Chronics Estate Planning. Or the Chronics Estate Planning Handbook. Maybe you can take it with you. Hmm. Um, and the other one that came out last year, The Affordable Immortal. Maybe you can beat death and taxes. Hmm. We had him on for an episode to talk about that. And his whole thing is he actually has his estate planned in such a way that he will continue to accrue wealth after he's declared legally dead. Hmm. That I now wonder precisely how he'll be entitled to collect if he's ever revived. But I presumably mean, he's thought of that. And un- he's under current up. laws, he's not. But, you know, if, if he'd set up through some sort of a trust that, you know through the line of Merlin unbroken down the, down the, <laughs> down the centuries when he's woken up, they're like, Oh, Rudy, you're back. Yes. Here's your stuff. Mm-hmm. I think that's what he's hoping for. Mm-hmm. Maybe they get 10% for maintaining the trust over the last thousand years. Right. Yeah. Um, sorry, Rudy, I didn't read your book, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a copy. <laughs> um, it's all you need. Put it near you while you're sleeping. And you start getting it by osmosis. God, I wish that worked. Oh, that'd be so, cool. <laughs> so, um, according to at least Rudy's thesis, which I can't, uh, vindicate for having read myself, but, uh, he seems to think it's distinctly plausible that you can absolutely save your own money Mm -hmm. in such a way that you can collect it down the road. Um, And actually that's not insane. If you have kids, Um, you know, and maybe that actually is his plan. He does have kids. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I leave my estate to my, my, my descendants. Mm -hmm. And if in 400, in 10 generations, um, I'm like, Hey, it's me, your great ex grandfather. Um, Can I have some of that money that you guys are all living and enjoying off of now? They're like, Oh yeah, of course we'll take good care of you. Right. I would really hope that I would get revived while someone who knew me in life is still alive because once nobody that remi- that knows you has power or rights is around, I think your chances of reclaiming that money drop drastically. Like if, um, I don't know, I don't even know my grandparents, but like if some ancestor of mine from the year 1000 AD showed up and was like, hey, give me money now, <laughs> I'd be like... I don't know. How much do I actually owe you? <laughs> the genes have been diffused so much and everything happening since then. But in a way, everything. <laughs> yeah, right. if, I didn't, if I didn't ply your great-great-grandmother over and over, you wouldn't even exist. Right. So, yeah. you know, I would, I would want a DNA imagine, test maybe if there was no proof. Yeah. But. I imagine you could pr- portion it out, you know, put like some amount of your money towards future self and let it accrue and the rest to your descendants. So you don't have to like be in the awkward position of coming back <laughs> like hey i'm your great great so the grandfather please give me money <laughs> yeah i you know i i don't i don't really like the idea of charity because i i don't want to live on charity and i'm doubtful that these perpetuities uh will last that long maybe a hundred years uh if we're lucky it could work but anything more than that i doubt the money would still be there uh but i'm just of the opinion that if if you're in the future with a working brain you'd have a way to pay because I mean, already a large fraction of labor is mental labor, right? Like, Stephen, you do mental labor exclusively. Uh, I kind of do. I don't know. It's, there's there's physical labor I do as well. But, like, if you have a brain, you can work with your brain and you can make money with that work. I would like to think that, you know, especially if you're waking up in a Matrix-style simulation, that, like, all the work is done. Yeah. Or, right? yeah, or you're just waking up in a post-scarcity future where money doesn't matter yeah. anyway. Right. So, like, the, the cost between putting you in a Matrix the size of planet Earth or the Matrix the size of your living room is going to be negligible, mm-hmm. right? Possibly. Um, or at least it seems like it would be weird to lock you in your own little pocket when it's, like, we can just connect you to the web. We're not going to charge you. You know, you don't have money. Why would we? Mm-hmm. I, I think that, that I don't... I'm not too worried about that one. Yeah. I don't um, think it's a stretch at all to think that there'd be some way to earn money. One way that I know that Rudy and I do view the future differently is that he seems to pretty confident that we're coming back with meat suits. Okay. And remember that came up during the episode? That is apparently a more common belief among uh, the older cryonicists. He's yeah. an older cryonicist. Yep. Yep. But I don't see a meat suit necessarily. No, or if I do, it's not going to be this one. Mm. It'll be a new one they make make for me, kind of like the yeah. sixth of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Maybe one that is optimized for whatever work the future needs done. Yeah. Maybe one that's the right gender. You get to pick your meat suit from scratch? Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? That'd be awesome. I know, right? I could finally have a, like, I could be big and strong like a grown-up. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 32. I'm still waiting for that to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that sounds great. Uh, so I think that with all of these, there are, there are corollaries where, you know, the good outcome is actually really, really cool. But you can, there, there are always, always, you know, there's the chance of bad ones. This, this next one's an interesting intuition pump here. Or thought provoker, or um, what would I pay to come back with my personality but no memories? Not so much. I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, how about memories but a different personality? Again, not so much. Mm-hmm. Um, me interjecting there. It depends on how different personality. You know, yeah. There's some things about my personality I totally pay to have taken away or added. <laughs> gotcha. Um, but anyway, he says uh, I think I'd be okay with ninety percent of each, but somewhere somewhere there is a line that current me is not willing to pay for, but a simulated me would have no idea about. The spreadsheet does not have an entry for insufficient accurate simulation or insufficiently accurate simulation. Mm -hmm. That is a, um, that's a point that I think is discussed considerably and not on that post or not in the link thing that he links to, but just in the broader conversation about it. Um, there is the, the kind of like take a step back from your life question and say, would I rather cease to exist in any capacity forever or continue to exist for a billion years at like 50% accurate simulation? You know, it's like I, some version of me persists, right? Mm-hmm. It's, I think the one way for that I pumped that intuition, and I don't, I don't know if someone gave me this idea or not, but it's like, if I had, if I had a traumatic brain injury and I became a slightly different person, I think I preferred that over dying. But there is some threshold yeah. where I'd be like, okay, fuck that. The new me sucks. Yeah. And old me would never have been okay with this. You come back, but you're evil. Right. <laughs> Goatee. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so if, if, uh, you know, I don't know, um, I could think of, think of examples of various ways to get hit in the head that change our personality a little bit, but there are ways of that that don't suck. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are ways of that that you might be okay with. Uh, anyway, what are your guys' thoughts? I'm talking too much. Hmm. I think I'm more willing to kind of come back with, uh, my memories, but a different personality than with my personality, but no memories, because I think that you can you are your experiences. Um, and again, it's kind of just the, you know, n- neutral outcome. It sounds like, you know, something like you comes back or some, you know, something that's maybe more like you or maybe like only a tiny bit, but like, you know, neutral outcomes for, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, like, I think the question is like, is it worse than dying? I don't, yeah, yeah. And I, like, I think, no, I'd, I'd, I'd like for more people to exist. So like, it's kind of the equivalent of like, I mean, it's almost kind of the equivalent of like you die but like your kid lives on you know i was gonna say the same thing it it wouldn't feel like it was me with enough change and do i want to pay that much money for someone else to live mm-hmm. i mean i guess it's not that much money so that's okay but i wouldn't choose to do that uh, i'm doing this because i want to live that is interesting and I, I know we've talked about this before but the, the cost of this is not um like you have to orient your entire life around making this project successful right right it's it's not negligible but it's not huge either. It, it's not precisely negligible, but yeah, it's not the most. It, it shouldn't. If it is the most expensive thing you're paying for, you're you're lucky as shit. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, so the lifetime membership at CI is I think sixteen hundred bucks or something now. It used to be a okay. thousand. Yeah. Um, maybe it's fifty. I don't know, something like that. Somewhere between one and two thousand dollars, which is not not nothing. But if you like price that out over ten years, you know, hundred bucks a year, uh, eight bucks a month, like. That's half your Netflix subscription. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, but then the, the life insurance part is the part that costs money. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the preservation right now costs something, what, like 150K, give or take? Um, I think 100K is enough, but 150 would be safe. Yeah. So, and so there's some variance on like, this is actually something I don't know about. Um, maybe maybe my surviving relations relationships would get like a bill. So I've got my life insurance policy, which I know is pretty cheap. Well, I know the, the policy is cheap and so is the payout it's like just enough but like say suspended animation incorporated the people that fly out to the hospital to pick you up and freeze you and take you back to michigan to put you in the freezer um they incur some extra cost who do they bill for that if my life insurance policy can't afford it i guess and 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 what if they can't pay do they just throw me out of the helicopter like <laughs> uh so i i am actually curious about that i know they don't throw me out of the helicopter but i don't know what, what exactly the circumstances are there sounds like a question for rudy yeah or i, I can you know Ask the Chronics Institute too. So I believe they're paid up front, and if there isn't enough money to to pay their fee, they just don't go. 
How do they, how do they get paid up front? Life insurance policies don't pay out the second you're declared legally dead. Uh, they pay out really quick. That's that's the primary reason that um that they'd like to fund through life insurance policies rather than through wills because wills can take weeks to to process through the legal system, whereas life insurance policies pay out. I hear very quickly, but it, but uh, we're talking minutes. But I'm sitting there; they declare, le- That's declare true. me legally dead. Yeah. I'm sitting there, slowly rising to room temperature. Right. And- <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's a good point. They wouldn't get the money. Yeah, uh, especially because they fly the people out before you actually die. Right. You're like, um, okay, you're gonna die in the next twelve hours or so. We're getting the crew over there. You can't get the the loan on your life insurance. This is this is a question with an answer, I'm sure, yeah. and I just don't know it. So I will. Uh, try to not be lazy and come with an answer in the near future um i can just email the you know uh the info line at ci okay we paused so i could do a couple quick research things um one i was wrong about the 1600 hundred dollar lifetime membership uh it's 1250 for a lifetime and it's half off if you if you're a member and you want to sign up like a spouse um i hope it's not just a married legal whatever spouse and maybe it's a partner but it's probably a spouse I suppose you could call and ask. They'd probably work with you. I think I did ask, and they said, like, oh, yeah, if it's, a, like, a parent or something, that's fine, too. Like, they aren't that picky about it. I think it's, I think it's family. Yeah, You're right. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, if you have a living partner, you can say, yeah, they're my family. Perfect. And then I was trying to look at the um, the fees for standby, stabilization, transport, and cryopreservation provided by Suspended Animation Incorporated. They're the ones that – so, like, the Chronics Institute has the storage in – I forget where – middle of nowhere, Michigan. Um Turns out if you, it's like twenty eight thousand dollars for preservation there. Mm-hmm. The other hundred thousand that you're paying is for suspended animation to fly out to you know on an emergency call. Mm-hmm. They dispatch the, to the hospital that you're brought to after a car crash or whatever. They're standing there waiting for you to die, and then they pump you full of crap protectant, toss you in the helicopter, and fly you back to Michigan. Um, so th- there is a breakdown here on the link that I will put in the show notes. Uh, heads up, it is not friendly for mobile format. That's why I'm not reading the numbers now because they're all squished. <laughs> it's like a picture rather than a proper text. Um, but anyway, numbers will be forthcoming. So I think those are the two things I found, right? Suspended Animation Inc. Yeah. The cost. Okay. So I think that's that for the money part. Um, so yeah, I think we talked about coming back with memories. And... Well, I mean, oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't sure what exactly, how exactly to reply to that. Like, obviously I wouldn't want to pay money for someone who's kind of like me, but not me to be around or not, not very much money anyway, but, um, a, I don't know. I hope that doesn't happen. Like, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure how else to, to reply to that. Like, I still feel like it wouldn't be necessarily a bad outcome. It would just be not your, you know, the same as if the, you weren't able to be revived, which you were saying you already assigned a pretty high, you know, you think that that might happen anyway. Yeah. Like, like, it's, like, it's not like, but it's not a worse future if someone like you exists. Honestly, it, it almost seems like the question boils down to what if they can't revive me yeah because it that this sounds like yeah they revived someone kind of like me but not me and that just goes under my bucket of it's impossible to revive me in the future which i've already priced in as pretty likely but that said this scenario is a little less bad in that you dedicated some portion of your lifetime income towards saving somebody just happened not to be you <laughs> right <laughs> that's a good way to put it it's a highly inefficient use of my money if i'm trying to save people <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually true yeah and this this is like this was actually that is not the true rejection so i don't think that should be considered yeah but on a on a, on a related side note there i had somebody ask me at like a meetup and it wasn't it was like a effective altruist meetup mm. and they like they found me twice to try and like drill this point down and be like you know you realize that like chronics is like highly not effective altruism right yeah and I'm like, at the time, I was kind of more just surprised that they seemed so, like, energetic about the point. So I don't know how I was five, six, seven years ago whenever this happened. Mm-hmm. But if they asked me now, I'd be like, yeah, it's not. <laughs> my, my EA money is, it goes elsewhere. Correct. This, 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 <laughs> this, is, this is my uh, selfish money, right? This, yeah. is, this is for me. Yeah. Um, I'm not doing this to be altruistic. I'm doing this so that I don't die. Exactly. <laughs> Same reason that I do a lot of things in life. Yeah. Um, so then there, there are a few more things here. Uh, Steve says, I like to learn. We may be able to simulate brains someday by replicating synapses, but that's a whole different question to simulate brains that can learn, at least the way that meat brains uh, learn. That I don't have a good answer on, as other than like I think a it's like a functionally isomorphic brain that runs on on uh, silicon yeah. would work the same as ours, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I'm not sure what the question is. It seems to be like, what if we can't actually simulate a brain correctly? I mean that. I would like not to be revived if you can't actually simulate my brain correctly. Yeah, that was kind of my takeaway. Uh, 
if we can simulate a brain, it's, you know, going to have to do the things that brains do, like take in new information and print old information. Maybe it'll be different. Hopefully it will be better. Mm -hmm. I would really like to have a computer brain rather than my stupid meat one <laughs> that like does things like walking around the house going, where are my glasses when they're on my head? Or like, <laughs> right. you know, or you walk in a room and you're like, what did I come in here for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that uh, that's just more of a, maybe a scientific question, but I think that's more of a philosophical question. Like, I, I don't know what it would mean to make a brain that's just like mine, but doesn't run on meat. But then that brain can't learn because then it's not just like mine. Yeah. Then it's a different kind of thing. And it's mm -hmm. also not really a brain. Yeah, then right. it's something else. Um, this one, I think you talked about it before, Jace. Uh, meat brain function is tied to a lot of chemistry that would also need to be tied into simulation. I suppose you can fake the inputs, but you need a whole body to model that well. Um, yeah, that is something that worries me, especially about the type of cryopreservation that's only your brain or your head or, you know, the one that I want to get eventually, the resin mm. plasticization one. Uh, yeah, a lot of our brain is in our gut. <laughs> And I don't know how they're going to do that, but but I don't know how they're going to do a lot of this stuff. You know, that's why we're not doing it now. We don't we don't know how to do it. Um, that is a problem. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's just, that's going to be another step in making in accurate revival, right? Or uh, rev 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 revivification. <laughs> that word. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what parts you'd miss if you were just a brain in a vat and not having the rest of your body. Um, but it's it. it it sounds like it's more than I intuitively would have guessed. And so part of it will either be making simulacra of the rest of the body or the parts that are needed to give that sort of feedback or just faking those inputs um, or making you fine without them. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about my ancestor from 1000 AD who wants all my money. If uh, we went back there and we said, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of communicating with other people is the, the vibration of air molecules between two people. So how are you going to, communicate with someone on the other side of the planet like it would just it would be too diffuse you wouldn't be able to concentrate as much acoustic energy as you need in any sort of practical way you had a very smart ancestor <laughs> right <laughs> and and i would be like i don't know man maybe the future will find some other ways to send signals long distances like i i don't know how the um how the future is going to revive me and what needs to be done uh, i'm not sure if anyone does maybe some people do right now uh maybe no one knows yet and it's a thing we'll discover in decades to come. But uh, my qu my answer is, yeah, I, I, I don't know how the simulation would work. Uh, the assumption here is that eventually they're going to find, the human race will find a way to uh, make a simulation that works. And that's when we reap the benefits of being unfrozen or simulated or whatever. Yeah, and again, uh, I feel like if we do get this level of technology, there's a lot of stuff we could improve. I mean, I currently take antidepressants and Adderall for ADD, and like, it would be cool to actually fix my brain chemistry <laughs> or mm -hmm. make it controllable. Same with getting a meat body that's better. That'd be cool. No, you, you make a good point. I kind of forgot about that. Yeah, I take my meds every morning. It would be nice to have a brain that didn't need them. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I didn't always take them. I could get by without them. But you know, point stands. You know, right now you're drinking coffee. I had I had my caffeine already today. Like, yeah, we're, wouldn't we're, it be cool if you just had like this internal, you know, heads up display that's like, hey, add more adrenaline, <laughs> a, a little bit meter. more uh, stamina meter. Mm -hmm. uh, some dopamine. Yeah. Take I... a snapshot of that state. All right, cool. <laughs> Run that one in the morning. What's the brain that didn't need caffeine because he didn't need the stimula stimulation to, you know, get your brain going and just uh yeah, I so it's it's tough. I think that that's that's sort of like like I think you know she said that like no one knows how that works. Maybe somebody does. I think that I'm sure there are I'm sure that there are people whose job it is is to, you know, be thinking about and figuring this stuff out. I don't know who they are. Yeah. Um, so I I guess I will look around or check. I don't know. I was going to say just Google it, but that sounds so condescending, but I meant it in a not condescending way. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there's some field of study, I'm sure, related to, like, the problem of... Uh, but again, it's, at this point, it's probably mostly speculative, right? I would assume so. Yeah, it's going to be like, uh, you know, the Future for Humanity Institute probably has a department thinking about this, but it, they probably are just thinking there's quite a few scientists trying to study, you know, animal models of freezing and reviving, you know, mice or insects or frogs, which are, it's really cool that frogs do this naturally, like. Fucking cheaters. You know, uh, <laughs> they can actually, like, bury themselves in snow and hibernate mm -hmm. and be effectively dead and then 
come back. I feel like that's a cool model to study to see how we could do it. Yeah, they just get out of the box for free, though. That's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> but they also have to be frogs. So, like, okay, it comes with some downsides. Yeah, that would that would suck. Um, They're so porous. <laughs> all right. So this this is a good one. Um, I would love to extend my fam my life so that I could spend time with with family and do what I want to do. I'd pay good money for one in one hundred twenty five chance of an extra thirty years of healthy life. I'm not sure I'd pay nearly that much to come back in decades or centuries without any of that context. And that's that's a good point. Part of the solution to this is get your friends and family to sign up. Yeah, that's um, a big one. You know, then that way you don't get thirty years; you get thirty million years with them. Mm -hmm. um, now, granted, uh, and this will actually come at the end. So, I let's put a pin in the fact that fallback chronics is my fallback plan. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to make sure we circle back to that. So, I'm, yeah, I, I agree with him completely. Um, I, I guess that is why I am not paying a huge amount of money for cryonics. <laughs> If I could get a guaranteed extra 30 years of healthy life, I would be paying a lot more money than I'm paying for cryo. Yeah. yeah. I'm still hoping that medical science advances to the point where I don't have to die. But uh, yeah, this is kind of like asking if, you know, all of your friends and family just disappeared. Would you commit suicide? Like, is life not worth living or like... I mean, maybe. It might be for some people. Yeah. yeah. Or like, it might just be, you know, you move on and you find new friends and partners and but right and now, like it sucks a little bit like yeah. it's not as bad as a literal death yeah i know right now i'm gonna have a uh, steven in the future i'm gonna have uh, my girlfriend charlie in the future again assuming that this th stuff works out um so I i'm not gonna be dumped into a world completely all alone and part of that is by design i do tell people i love hey you should do this thing and and you hide the knowledge from your enemies <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> but no I, I think that that is the main um that's the main solution to that. And I I need to do it again before, it's, before I don't have time to. But you know, I floated the idea to my grandma like 10 years ago. And it's hard to I think. This is hard to sell with the elderly. Yeah. Because they're like, I've been tired and sore for 30 years. Like, I'm not going to deal with that for another million years. Mm. Are you kidding me? My yeah. grandmother is, believes in heaven, too. So, like, mm. that's kind of that would be blasphemy. Yeah. yeah. Mine doesn't. Um, my mom said she would sign up. And I haven't done yeah, anything that's awesome. that. I need, I need to get her actually. I need to get the ball rolling there. Um, so, you know, these... I don't know why. I, I well, I'm kind of like phobic when it comes to death stuff. So whenever that comes up, I'm like, I get, I get nervous. But that's, I've got great incentive to get the fuck over that and start doing shit. So I, I'll talk with them about it very, very soon. Um, but yeah, you know, spread the word, get your friends and family to sign up is one solution. Um, all right, we'll hit the last point, then I'll hit the thing about. Well, we already kind of touched on it. You said that you hope life extension takes off, and that, that's my thing. Is yeah. I, I will, we'll hit your last point here right after this. But the my. Chronics for me is the is the plan B, yeah. right? Um, I I don't I don't know what my percentage that I think it'll work. It is probably one in <laughs> like I did I did the like some quick calculation and this was like on an older overcoming bias post. There were fewer like inputs for the Bayesian estimates, but it was like five percent or something. Mm -hmm. So I mean that that sounds roughly right. I, I'll have to think about all the things again. But frankly, I don't really care what the number is. You know, if it was one in ten million, I might change my mind. But I don't think it's that low. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not i don't think it's a great chance that it'll work i think it's an okay chance yeah. um it's worth the i just checked 65 bucks a month i spend at, at uh for kansas city life insurance um but the i mean the real plan is like live long enough for longevity technology to to start making real headway yeah and then uh you there's there's the concept of longevity escape velocity where you know say say you live to the te the technical breakthrough of look you take this pill and you live an extra 30 years. Um, by the time that 30 years is up, the next step of technology is out. And you take this pill or you take this shot and you, you live another 30, right? Mm -hmm. And lather, rinse, repeat. And you get like this kind of just, uh, what do they call that graph that goes, that swoops up? I've heard longevity escape velocity. Oh, uh, exponential. About exponential. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> the big, big swoopy one. The big yeah. swoopy graphs. Yeah. I'm a mathematician. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Longevity escape velocity. And I think it was Aubrey de Grey who might have coined the term or at least popularized it. Okay. Um, and we are still making progress on that as a, as a species. Uh, David Sinclair recently put out a six part, I think, podcast called Lifespan, which talked about uh, recent advancements. And I don't know. It's, it's promising. Hopefully, within the next several decades, we might have some actual uh, good anti analytics that'll start pausing the aging process or at least slowing it down. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited to see, you know, what we're going to be able to do with CRISPR. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm downloading uh, 
that podcast right now. Lifespan with Dr. David Sinclair. That's right. Also, I think this was on Netflix or Hulu. Our boy Chris Hemsworth just starred in a documentary on uh, futurism and and, and immortality. Um, avid transhumanist. I didn't know that, but I am overjoyed and not surprised to learn it because, you know, he's awesome. Do you remember what the name of the series is? I will find out right now. Okay. Um, Limitless with Chris Hemsworth. <sighs> and it comes out this year, actually. I think Steve had one last thing. Yes. I have a 1 in 125 chance of coming back as a simulation. If I spend 30k now, that has a good chance to turn into 1.5 million in 100 years. 4% growth after inflation, and Vanguard is much more stable than chronic startups. Current me can be pretty happy knowing that a lot of money is... Oh, this is perfect. Um, knowing that a lot of money is there to do good things versus a slight chance that there will be a simulation on a computer somewhere. That I will be a simulation on a computer somewhere. Um, great points. Um, so we, we talked about this kind of incidentally already. Mm -hmm. This, this is not effective altruism. Right. Um, you know, it would be awesome if, you know, th this is the sort of thing that actually people I sh you know, should look into if they have the excess funds to do it, set aside some money and then have it, whatever, vest for a hundred years or not vest, but, um, accumulate growth, whatever. Vanguard is doing a lot better than 4% for the last several years in some portfolios of it. I believe he says after inflation. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But. Um, this was back in November numbers. Yeah, inflation has gone up like 20% in the last two years. So, uh, oh, well, presumably, that, that's a made up number. But, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but presumably, um, Vanguard returns will also start going up to keep ahead of inflation. Good point. We'll see. Yeah. In any case, that's a very good point. Um, this is the sort of thing that you could turn into a lot of money to do a lot of good with in a century rather than spend it on a, uh, in in Steve's estimate, a less than one, one in 100 and a less than 1% chance of your simulated survival yeah if what um, you're looking for is altruism then this is not the way to do it uh also if what you're looking for is altruism i think you'd be better off spending thirty thousand right now than 1.5 million in 100 years because thirty thousand right now can do a lot of good over 100 years whereas having to wait 100 years to get 1.5 million really isn't going to do the people that could have been helped in that century uh a lot of good so if you're just thinking about ways to help people give the 30,000 now rather than trying to invest it. Who knows? 100 years from now, dollars may not even uh, have any value. The only true currency will be Dogecoin and you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, all of your money will be worthless. But on the other hand, if you're looking for ways to try to preserve your own continued existence, uh, you're not going to do that by giving money to other people. My main takeaway from what he's saying is that everything he said are uh, reasons not to do cryonics and are things that people should take into consideration. I have and I still think cryonics is a good idea. So there we go. Oh, yeah. Wait, to the last point, uh, and this seems kind of obvious, but why not both? <laughs> you, you could also, you know, spend 30k on, you could spend 30k on cryonics and also do your effective altruism thing. I mean, maybe you only have that much, but, but you don't have to make the choice if you do have the money, you know? <laughs> you could do both. Yeah, it's tough. And it, it would be nice if, you know, like when I signed up, I was uh, delivering pizzas part-time. Um, you know, I, I definitely didn't have the money to be like, where's my, oh, no, I, I had... Four dollars a month of spending on charity at the time, um, <laughs> uh, but the like it, it would, it's tough if you're if you're if you're weighing the decision of you know which choice do I take? Do I want to do good for the world or be selfish? And you have to make the decision like and it, and it can't be a both thing. That's that's tough and that's going to come to you. You know, um, you know. Hopefully, you know your life your life circumstances can change over the coming decades. And you know, for what it's worth, if you if you think that I would love to do both, which one do I pick first? I would suggest at the detriment of everyone else do cryonics first only because the cost will go up as you get older yeah um it's it's uh life insurance is more expensive when you get older um and you never know that you might uh have wished you'd signed up six months ago yeah right yeah um so it's it's uh it's always worth um i think putting on your own life vest first that yeah put on your own attach your own <laughs> exactly oxygen what I was gonna say. Att attempting to put on your neighbors <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah so anyway, Steve, that was great. Um, really sorry it took us six months to get back to you, uh, but this was a really good, thought-provoking um, uh, discussion. Discussion, yeah. So thanks again. Alrighty, let us move into the second half of the show, which actually isn't going to be a full half, but the second part of the show, where we talk about a less wrong post that got some attention recently: thesis on sleep. Uh, right. Theses. Theses. I think wasn't oh. it. Is it multiple? Oh uh, yeah, I guess there's yeah. All right. <laughs> I just like the word theses. We should call them thesi. Thesi, because theses is too much like testicles. What? I love it. <laughs> my, my favorite, my favorite Greek hero. Uh, yes. So this is on Less Wrong. It's written by Guzzi. I don't know how you pronounce that. G U Z E Y. Um, 
yeah, did you want to just summarize, Stephen? Yeah, the 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 bird's eye view summary is that um, the author believes that there's good reason to think that sleep research is largely bunk and draws several analogies between like other physical stressors and how that's actually good for you and how you can how you can adjust to them and that in their experience and opinion, this should all be true for sleep too. Um, am I is that an accurate and fair summary for two sentences? Yeah, they're yeah. kind of more specifically like consensus beliefs like adults need at least seven hours for health and sleep deprivation is harmful or false uh that's that seems like a rather extreme claim that's a radical claim my friend (laughs) (laughs) i I was gonna i was gonna start with the more like the things i found really interesting in here was his idea that comfortable modern sleep is an unnatural super stimulus and that sleepiness is similar to hunger and that some level of it is pretty normal because if you're if you're never hungry, then um, you're probably eating too much. And that was an interesting thought. Like I have many times, and I think I may have mentioned this on the podcast before, just thinking about our ancestors and the shitty, terrible lives they had in 1000 AD. Like, you know, the difference in, in quality of life and ability to think that we have what after a good night's sleep, right? And in the past, did anyone ever get a good night's sleep? They were fucking sleeping on rocks with people yelling nearby and it's cold and i don't i I can't imagine anyone got more than one or two good nights of sleep in their entire lives so no wonder they were all stupid and didn't know things because they couldn't brain good without any sleep like once technology hit the point where like the inside of the house stayed a comfortable temperature and you were slightly comfortable throughout the night then like suddenly we had a scientific revolution and three (laughs) centuries later we're in space (laughs) (laughs) i think actually uh hunter gathers to, or like you know probably our ancestors like slept in caves or other shelters with animal hides and like family huddles and we're probably fine i mean i think you're probably right like, in fact they may have gotten better sleep because they don't have our you know modern day stresses and noise pollution and ar- artificial lights messing with your i, I think our lack of good sleeping is probably just due to our to like our pampered you know uh, zero world problems of like how good we have it and it's like oh man you know the ac i can hear coming on and it that woke up a little bit and um so, where it's like back in the day it's like no we're comfortable covered in animal hides and like you said kind of like in a in a cuddle puddle with our with our tribe i can like, definitely see how um not looking to backlit screens late into the night is going to <laughs> have very good effects on your ability to sleep but on the other hand also like the cave gets cold overnight. There's always somebody in the cave that's moving or making noise, partly because you always need someone to keep watch anyway. Like, I just, I don't, I would be very surprised if our ancestors got better sleep than us. Maybe they were deeper sleepers. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they probably were. Like, I knew somebody who, I swear, you could pick up and physically move this person and they'd stay asleep. And that, I think that's because they always had, or at least their, most of their childhood, shared a room with at least one or two siblings. Right. And so... They just, it was learn to sleep hard or die. And so they, 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 <laughs> they nailed it. Um, I am more and more becoming a slightly heavier sleeper, which is great, but historically a very, very light sleeper. And so, you know, something happens near me and I wake up, you know, immediately. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I don't know. So that's, I guess our ancestors sleep aside. The the main thing is, uh, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how much we want to hit on the, the post, to, like the contents of it in particular. So I'll, I'll let you guys drive for this, for, I think for a bit. No, I thought there, there, yeah, there were a few interesting points in here. That they yeah, the first one being the the ancestor sleeping ability. The second one that he pointed out was that if you sleep as much as you want, you'll probably sleep too much and become susceptible to depression. Which I think is a, it's a decent point. Uh, I, I do think that if you oversleep, you're going to have some knock on mental effects. I've seen that happen a lot. I've seen it happen to myself even. But you know the. I'm not sure which way the causality necessarily goes yeah, there. That's what and, I was thinking. Like, and I, it, it sort of doesn't matter because it's sort of, but like, yeah, depression leads to oversleeping, which leads to more depression, which leads to more oversleeping, and yeah, and it sucks. But it's it's probably a good idea to not oversleep for specifically that reason. I do feel shitty if I sleep too much, but also undersleeping, which he seems to be suggesting throughout this uh, post, leads to worse mental health and worse depression. Like, I've never had as bad mental health days from oversleeping as I get from undersleeping. Mm, yeah. Like, sleep is crucial to not fucking up your mental health. Yeah. For the first time in, like, a month, I'm some I'm something approaching overslept today. Mm. And other than being a little groggy, I feel great. Nice. Whereas, like, this entire week I've been underslept, and I'm just, like, a fucking zombie. Yeah. I can't even believe that, like, I'm looking back at, like, Wednesday. I think it was, like, the most tired day. I can't believe that was just, like, three days ago or four mm. days ago. <laughs> it feels like it was... a 
like ages ago because my brain was so out of it. Yeah. Um, if all I get is like a little kind of groggy marshmallow brain, like that's not so bad. The, the biggest thing that kind of jumped out to me with this, because I have a experiment with polyphasic sleep mm. and uh, it, it hits a few of the points uh, talking. The guy talked about ancestors, um, but also like there are, you know, modern day tribes of hunter gatherers. And there was a study uh, of 84 of them. Uh, which isn't, you know, the best sample size, but... 84 people or 84 tribes? 84 people. Oh, okay. Um, I think. Okay. Uh, where the majority of them were sleeping something like 6.5 hours a night. I feel like that's, that's it's a straw man saying that uh, never being sleepy means you're probably sleeping too much. I don't think mm-hmm. advocates of getting good sleep say that you should never be sleepy. They say that you shouldn't be sleepy all day, every day. You should be sleepy towards the end of the day before you go to bed, mm-hmm. right? And maybe occasionally in the middle of the day. I mean... But, but at the very least, the target isn't, I should never be sleepy, right? right? At least, I've never heard that from, you know, sleep scientists. Or, yeah, anybody. <laughs> or anybody. So, uh, uh, Claudio Stompy, uh, he was specifically studying solo sailors. So, that's where kind of polyphasic like ideas came from. Because you do have to be awake 24-7 to sail, or, you know, be active. So, he came up with a polyphasic sleep cycle i forget which one it was uh i want to say like ultraman or uberman but uh i think i think it's the one that's divided into where the the day is divided into like five naps with periods of wakefulness between them equidistant uh and they did study this but very important oh wait it actually says it right here it's uh uh what well but very importantly this is a short-term thing over the span of a competition this is not a way you can live a life like in extreme search situations humans can do all kinds of crazy extreme things but they aren't sustainable i do believe that you can sleep more efficiently and again like i think that we have in the past the thing that they don't take into account with the hunter gatherers is naps yeah most of the world actually slept in two phases like there's even a bunch of you know like literature from like europe that Where they would talk about like the night shift where you wake up for about an hour in the middle of the night. Hmm. And that seems to be consistent with the way our uh, circadian rhythm works where it peaks in like, you know, first daylight uh, and then it dips at about like 3 p.m. midday. So like also a lot of cultures have a siesta type thing. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I was working, I would regularly have hard crashes around 2, 3 p.m. and mm -hmm. just be absolutely useless for an hour hour and a half and feel miserable and now that i am not regularly working i will often take little um almost naps i usually don't quite fall asleep but you know just just mm-hmm. lay down for 20 25 minutes recharge and it is absolutely wonderful and everybody should be able to do this with their lives oh yeah there's all kinds of research on the benefits of napping and it's pretty upsetting that as a culture and i think a lot of this does have to do with like the modern work day and artificial lights that we've like pretty much done away with adult naps my uh, my my own uh approach to that is probably not generalizable in that i i take amphetamines during the day <laughs> so uh in the form of adderall and yeah. i i take a immediate release pills and i i break them in pieces and take them throughout the day and the last one i take is around noon or one mm-hmm. and it's like a quarter of a pill mm-hmm. but since i'm titrating amphetamines throughout the day i don't get tired in the afternoon yeah. i come down like at night but uh that's not the best way to do it before that yes i'll get tired during the day that's why i had to stop experimenting with polyphasic and it's a bit annoying but also the adderall really improved my life so i'm like okay <laughs> yeah it's straight up worth making yeah um but yeah it i i know what you mean though because i i can remember a year ago when i wasn't on 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 drugs mm-hmm. all the time and yeah it there you know this is why like jay said other cultures and you know now and historically take midday breaks mm-hmm. you know and actually i'm not a scientist but uh it kind of makes sense that'd be like the hottest time of the day you know mm-hmm. it's like all right while it's hot and you're all gonna go get a heat stroke now is like kind of we're halfway through the day let's let's chill out for a bit go find some shade and relax for a little bit and ride out the hot part of the day yeah i can make up a just so story for that how that might have <laughs> yeah. happened yeah. and also the quote-unquote night shift like the evo psych which may be bullshit explanation for that is that's when people would get up to like have sex or walk around and you know make sure there's no enemies or read by candlelight it sucks i can tell i'm getting older because my body just starts waking up earlier now for no fucking reason and won't go back to sleep and i'm like this is this is my body trying to tell me that i should be a grandpa and (laughs) waking up when the teenagers are going to sleep so someone's watching the toddlers this sucks 
man, I hope that's not what's happening to me. I even on like weekends, I'm up by seven or eight. Mm. Today I slept until ten, which hasn't happened in pushing, you know, maybe, maybe once in the last six or eight months. Mm-hmm. Like it was, it was great. So yeah, uh, but it's it's shocking, like having your body start waking you up earlier than you expect. I kind of wish that would happen to me. I have to use alarms still if I want to get up at any reliable time. My body still wants to stay up until like five a.m. and then sleep till noon or one. I think if you're staying up that late, though, then, you know, that wake up time makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, like, I don't think that's unhealthy. I'm just, I have a night owl, like, pro- propensity. Mm-hmm. There's different chronotypes. It's another thing that annoys me that, like, isn't more commonly known or that nobody cares about in society. They force everybody to, you know, have the early mm-hmm. to early to wake and early to bed schedule. What's the so- chronotype where you're always tired? <laughs> 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 oh, man. He Old. Does, yeah. <laughs> he makes one claim that I am um, inclined to be partial to, where he says that most sleep research is extremely unreliable and we shouldn't conclude much on the basis of it. Uh, the only reason I am inclined to to be to be charitable to this view is because the replication crisis and basically all of science over the last ten years, it's just become more and more apparent that. Most research in general is unreliable, and we may not want to conclude as much on the basis of it as we used to. I think more in the social sciences. Definitely more in the social sciences. But in general, it's... God, I, I saw the most depressing statistic recently that said uh, the more educated someone is, the more likely they are to simply dismiss a new study out of hand. Because, you know, they're they're the most likely to know that uh, a lot of research is p-hacked bullshit. And so don't even just, bother. Yeah, an early sort of investigational thing, too. Um, I kind of hate the thing where, I, I, well, I kind of hate science reporting, <laughs> where, you yeah. know, someone finds, like, they maybe found a, a cool particle, and, like, the headline <laughs> is just like, Einstein was wrong, yeah. this is the new Higgs boson, or whatever, like, you know. And science proves teleportation is real. There's so many studies that I've read the title, and then the, the act, and then I've read the study, and the, the study Not- says like the actual opposite of what was implied by the title yeah <laughs> the only thing i'll say to the point in the in this post that sleep research is largely bunk is that then you better not try and convince me of anything based on sleep research right um which he does hmm. and so i i think that it's trying to have your cake and eat it too um granted if, if you have some reason to think that this particular sleep research is the exception to the general rule that you're saying that most of it's garbage then you can spell that out, but I don't remember him doing that. Yeah, but you need to like provide, you know, evidence for that claim too. Right. Like, why? Why are these studies the good ones, and the other ones are the biased P act ones? You mm-hmm. know. So I, there are a lot of implications in this post, which in general I don't agree with. But it seems like the main primary claim that he actually makes is an entirely reasonable one. Uh, as far as I could tell, his primary claim was that decreasing sleep by one to two hours a night in the long term has no negative health effects. And he he, st- he stated that uh, the average adult gets seven to nine hours of sleep. And so in my mind, he's basically saying people who get seven to nine hours of sleep could probably scale it down to six to eight hours of sleep with neg- no negative health effects. I don't know and- how he could possibly suspect that. Like, I know he, he I, and it's been a while since I've read the post, but yeah. I'm assuming he's citing some sleep research. And so I'm, I'm immediately skeptical. I'm immediately skeptical. I, yeah, I actually disagree with that claim. Yeah, me too. I think uh, short term, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. Uh, but like, there are... I get, like people need different amounts of sleep. They even bring up the mutation that just let you know. I knew a girl with that in high need. school. She oh, needed, she needed no like way. four or five hours yeah. of sleep a night, and she functioned great. For <sighs> hours. Yeah, <laughs> but it is an, an interesting uh, the, the fact that that chronotype exists or not chronotype um, phenotype that you know mutation. Gee, I guess that would be one of the first things I'd crisper into me. Right. The thing is, I wonder. I was talking to somebody about this like ten years ago. Just quick sentence. He was like, "That sounds great." But you have to wonder, like, there's no free lunch in evolution, right? Like, if this was just purely advantage and nothing else, mm. you'd think it might have gotten around. Right. But then again, I guess being awake a little longer than everyone else didn't confer that much of a survival advantage. Are you still in contact or know some way to contact this girl? Uh, Yeah. Could you ask, like, have you had any long-term health consequences from not sleeping as much? Hey, we haven't talked in 15 years, but I was yeah. curious. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Someone in the SF Bay rat community has this uh, and has written quite a bit about it, I 
a good, I don't have to bug a stranger from high school. Been to <laughs> actually bug see a stranger from high school. Young. You know someone in your own personal life. That I, could be interesting. I believe she has kids now, too. So maybe that was like a superpower for having kids. Fuck yeah. Because like the kid's already up screaming all night. You know, she's like, well, fuck it. I'm awake anyway. Yeah. As long as the superpower doesn't come with like dying at 55. That's the thing that I'm curious about, right? Like, mm. do these people all get dementia at 60? Or no, they are they, you know, really likely to? I have no idea. No, they, they have been studied. They live, that they're perfectly healthy and fine. That's it's just, you know, there, there's other kinds of genetic mutations, like the like extreme resistance to cold or the longevity gene, the like Fox, whatever, uh, that people like there, yeah, there are a range of good and bad genes. They all have trade-offs. Uh, otherwise they'd be prevalent in the population, right? Not as, maybe that's the thing. Like the sleep one seems not to be the case, right? Like, mm. I think I mean, why are just, we all not Chris Hemsworth? Yeah. The, the benefit right? just seems to be that like, <laughs> there's some amount of scattering. Yeah. It just seems like there, the benefit seems to be not conveying that much of our survival advantage um but i don't know anyway the you were saying um so i'm glad that you guys disagree because i i don't have strong priors on my like knowledge on like my my how much i trust my background knowledge of sleep science Mm -hmm. um i recall that he said that that guy um what's his name uh matthew walker he calls him a crank and he links to something that he said i just i disagreed with this book at length here and i didn't read that Mm -hmm. Um, which one was matthew walker he wrote why we sleep oh yeah I listened to a four hour four hour podcast episode with him when mm-hmm. it was on the Making Sense podcast with Sam Harris, mm-hmm. and a he has the most like smooth, relaxing voice of anybody ever. Perfect for a sleep scientist. Yeah, <laughs> and, why we sleep is because you listen to my voice. Yeah. But but he seemed super knowledgeable. Now that said, since I'm not knowledgeable in the domain of sleep science, a crank would sound knowledgeable to me too. Right. right. But he didn't say anything that didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, well, no, a couple things. He did seem to overplay, like you know, a couple bad nights of sleep, and you know. You'll never recover. He, oh, he didn't say it quite like that, but there was some mm, gesturing towards catastrophization that I feel like That's you smoked marijuana know. one time. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that there was some catastrophization there, but um, I don't know. He sounded so confident that I feel like he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I mean, I don't know if the, the the primary claim applies to the majority of Americans or not, or majority of Western people. But I could, I could see quite a a fair chunk of the population possibly getting more sleep than they really need and being able to scale back their sleep by an hour a night without difficulty. Or like on occasion, there was a thing that I was, I like never pulled all nighters before because I read all the, again, the kind of scaremongering sleep research. that's like, you'll never recover that sleep debt. Hmm. And then I looked more into the uh, polyphasic sleep community, learned a lot more sleep science and was like, now I will pull an all nighter like once a month. Oh, wow. I did one recently uh, to move, and it was really funny, though, like, what Stephen, you were saying, there was, like, a day that seemed to, or you were saying, like, Wednesday felt like a really long time ago, the day after, because I used modafinil, uh, but, and, and I was, like, fine the day after, except that it felt like there was this extreme time dilation, Yeah. because I guess, yeah, again, like, your circadian clock gets messed up, but, like, I, can't, I remember, like, being at work and checking the clock, thinking, like, surely, like, hmm. several hours have gone by, and it was, like, 15 minutes had passed, I was like, oh, my God. This is the longest day. <laughs> that was my thing. And for me, just on that note, modafinil, when I'm really sleep deprived, has this weird effect of making me function more or less as good as I would like. But in my head, I'm still really tired. Hmm. But like, I, I respond fast enough. I'm able to keep a train of like, a, I'm able to finish a sentence with about the same ability I am at right now, which is to say 50, 50 shot. <laughs> um, but uh, it's weird. Cause like, I feel like I'm going I'm going the speed limit, but there's like no gas in the tank, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like I'm just riding on fumes, but like it doesn't. I don't know. It's a weird sensation, and I've only done it a few times. Uh, but it's it's uh, that's my my experience on it anyway. I do think if you're one of those people who doesn't do drugs because drugs are bad in K, then just pulling an all nighter can get you a similar headspace to some milder forms of drugs because it really does it fucks with your brain, makes you a bit manic. Yeah. Yeah yeah there's it can make you a bit detached as well a bit disassociated i Mm. found can we link to that ssc post where he talks about um that and maybe this was just a mention in a post uh where you can cure depression by not sleeping oh sure like do you know what i'm talking about oh yeah that was really interesting and the thing is but since you can't not sleep for that long your depression comes back after you crash and go to sleep Mm -hmm. um but that is you're right because when you said that sleep deprivation makes you manic you're absolutely right in fact i remember like times in elementary school staying up super late with friends and just like 
having really energetic conversations and like, oh man, we can like start a small business and make money at like, we're like 11. Mm -hmm. And then the next day it's like, that was dumb, right? <laughs> but you're sitting, it is, that, that was pure mania. Yeah, that's that's something. Mm -hmm. So you, you put that that was his primary claim, that decreasing sleep one to two hours a night in the long term has no, ne no negative health effects. I think so. That's what I got out of it. He, like he had implications in the post, but didn't come out and directly claim any of them. That's that's fair. I guess I, I wasn't looking when I was reading it through, I wasn't so much thinking about like what is his primary claim here. His primary claim seemed to be y'all are too worried about sleep, and that's fine. And yours is a more like articulate version of that. I mean his but, the implications tended to be things like you should occasionally damage your sleep, it'll help you um have better sleep overall, um polyphasic sleep is a great idea and anyone can do it. Like stuff like that that I think is like crazy out there, but he never actually comes out and says that directly. Except he he, well, you're right. He doesn't say you should do this. I know for sure. Mm -hmm. But that was the the first thing he said. That was what jumped. Up. That was the most salient point to me. Mm -hmm. That I'm like, this just reeks of nonsense. But I can't put my finger on it. The idea that, um, you know, well, what happens when you exercise? You know, you, you're out of breath, and he gives like like this uh, this analogy. So yeah, when you exercise, you do damage your muscles, which mm -hmm. causes them to grow back stronger. But like that doesn't work for everything. I think actually in the rebuttal they say like so would you break your toe and does your toe grow back stronger like yeah <laughs> and then also they're like this is you know they say you stub your toe I think or yeah but, but there actually is a thing where you know if you hit your bones and cause tiny micro fractures through them they do get harder over time right scar tissue so is harder to cut toe, through than regular skin you get yeah. calluses but, but it's but it's not like um I I don't I I I messaged somebody about this post when I first read it and I was like this it's like he's saying like kind of like crawler from worm. This was a guy who, whatever damage he took, he would recover from and then be more resistant, resistant to that damage. Mm. Uh, Anti-fragility. Right. Mm. So, you know, of course, he's cutting his arms off and setting himself on fire over and over so he's permeable <laughs> to... Yeah, he's fucked up. Yeah. Um, so, I'm like, this guy seems to be implying that, like, the more you fuck your sleep, you know, you can become the world weightlifting champion of sleep deprivation. Mm. You know, look at this. Because I trained for 10 years, I can go two weeks without sleeping. Mm -hmm. And that just seems... It seems to be that he's generalizing from a handful of cases... Um, that like every physical stressor makes you stronger for having experienced it and more resistant to it in the future. Yeah. And not I, everything works like muscles. I, yeah. It should be cool, but I don't think that's, that's the case. And I, I found the analogy there just to be like so incongruous, but perfectly reasonable sounding. That's why I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. It sounds reasonable, but it, it just, or it's presented so reasonably, but it just does not land for me. Yeah. The thing that frustrates me about this is that I am actually an advocate of polyphasic sleep, but like, Oh, still. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I thought you had a really bad experience with it. No, my experience was that I wasn't able to actually consistently do the naps because life got in the way. Hmm, okay. But because uh, it, it is really hard to do and it's not for everybody. Um, I, I primarily remember you being like, at least it seemed for me rather out of sorts and like hurting during that time period. But also, again, I guess if you were missing a lot of naps, yeah. maybe you could say it was bad implementation. There was other stuff going on in my life that that's, was causing that. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, the f five. Uh, 0.5 hours of sleep with the 20 minute naps is like the extreme hardcore version there's the there's just the version where you sleep 6.5 hours and take a 30 minute nap oh uh in the middle of the day and yeah that could totally almost work. everybody could do that and that does give you more efficient sleep this person also doesn't talk at all about sleep cycles only by like hours of sleep you know hours of time spent in bed mm -hmm. and it's it's a lot more complicated than that there's different you know set stages of sleep that you have to complete they call it a cycle the number of cycles you stack ha has different implications and Pro if you want to like know more stuff there's a polyphasic discord that has tons of self like n of one self studies and are also gathering data from lots of people who are trying different forms of polyphasic to get better at it also probably everybody could cut a significant i'm not sure what you think of significant but could cut 30 minutes to an hour off how many much sleep they need every night if they stopped looking at backlit screens at least an hour <laughs> before bedtime that really makes a big difference and also i know i am guilty i still sometimes look at backlit screens even right up to the point i'm about to go to bed and i am a bad person but like seriously it takes longer to get into a decent sleep cycle if you're doing that and so you'll spend more time in bed nominally sleeping even if you aren't getting good rest. Yeah, good sleep hygiene and then also light therapy are like some of the best interventions. Then, yeah, maybe I think you would be a lot more resilient to an occasionally like, you know, occasional sleep deprivation or interrupted sleep. But I think, again, like resiliency is not the same as anti-fragility. You don't, it makes no sense that by like 
randomly sort of interrupting. I don't know. Um, I'm just rambling a bit at this point. <laughs> you don't get better hearing by occasionally blasting really loud yeah. noises that hurt your ears. That's a good. That's a good analogy, and that actually fits better with the you know because you, you're able to find some if you squint a counterexample to the stubbing your toe thing, right? Mm -hmm. But hearing damage is just hearing damage. Um, you know, there there is no like for, there's no version of stressing your ears that I'm aware of that like makes you hear sharper. Yeah. It, it it might be less damaging or something, but um, yeah. So it's the how did you put it in your last sentence? It, uh, resistance isn't anti-fragility. Yeah, mm -hmm. resilience. I, resilience, yeah. I like that a lot. I mean, like, over over the years, I've become more adept at managing a day after having a bad night's sleep. But that's more just like finding coping, yeah. like, you know, practice strategies. Yeah. Um, it's it's not like I'm... I might even be better at being super tired. Maybe, maybe that's what it means to say I have coping strategies for it. Right. But it doesn't mean that, like, I'm less fucked up from it. It just means that it's having less of an impact on me. Yeah. Um, you know, if if I'm trying to run with like the analogy of like exercising, um, it's, you know, it, it'd be like, yeah, every time that I push myself way too hard, you know, running too far, hypothetically, if I ever, ever did that, um, mm -hmm. you know, the next day I'm a wreck for this, for these reasons. And I've learned that I can, I can do these couple of things to manage it, but that's just finding ways to manage it. Right. Yeah. And also you can hurt yourself permanently by over exercising. Or doing it wrong, especially with like wrong. heavy weight lifting. Yeah. Uh, do we want to? I think that's a. That's basically it, right? Yeah. Do we want to go through the rebuttal? I don't know. Or I'm... is it? Or do we just want to link to it? I want to mention that a good it. rebuttal exists. Yeah. Um, I just heard about it yesterday when I got the email from Less Wrong for like the occasional updates. I did scan through, and I think a lot of it is basically the same stuff we were saying. Yes, and it was put. It was put in a way that is like very. Um, like articulate yes and uh, as science. opposed to us well uh, by that i mean um, more scientifically rigorous yeah yeah um the author cites proper studies and stuff wow. the the author of the counter theses on sleep is natalia mendonca mendoca it's a c with a little squiggle under it i think that's pronounced like an s but... oh good mendoza mendonca sorry if i'm ruining your name natalia <laughs> um i liked it because it was a, a scientifically rigorous um response me for me it was just like this is hitting all of my, I, I, it was more of like a curiosity. Mm. I'm reading this. I'm like, this is hitting my skeptical radar, but I can't put my finger on it. Mm. And it's, it's like my spider sense is going off, but I don't know why. Well, I think, um, yeah, like yeah. he makes interesting points and some good points, but ultimately I kind of felt the same way as you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it, it's like monarchy, <laughs> very interesting and some good points, but ultimately the, the main thing that I, cause I, I, I couldn't try to summarize Natalia's post here, but what I can say is that, she goes through and, and hits the um, even the sci like the scientific stuff that uh, that Guzzi links to and says actually if you read it it says this and like pulls out excerpts mm. and it's like this this is making the opposite point of what you said it said and they they do that a few times and so do check that out too yeah there's one that uh, I want to pull out like Guzzi ha had uh, claimed that he had this one study that showed that. Uh, Sleep deprivation increases BDNF expression, so brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And Natalia pointed out that if you read the whole study, it says that if the sleep deprivation becomes chronic, then it's de then it starts to decrease, which is, I think, the primary mechanism that is likely behind the reason why, like, occasional sleep deprivation can be a temporary cure for depression, but not a long-term solution. From uh, Scott's post. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, and there, there are a lot of quick nuggets of sanity checks in there that I really enjoyed. So, yeah. um, you know, the, the answer might be somewhere in the middle. It might be kind of interesting to, to see at the very least, whether or not like Guzzi is going to die on the hill of like every point they made in this post. What I really like about it is that it was extremely thought provoking Yeah, and it, it, it made my brain have to work to engage with it, which is cool. So. And for some people, maybe it'll identify some areas where maybe they could cut a half hour out of their sleep time. Sure. Yeah. And what were you going to say though? Um, he had this um, really interesting thing, which I think it'd be great to acknowledge more frequently and more openly that uh, generally your level of sleepiness is a reflection of the boringness of your environment <laughs> much more than it is uh, an indication of how much you need sleep. And I mean, obviously, that's not always the case, especially if you are sleep deprived. Uh, but yeah, generally, if I'm in something that's really boring, unless I'm extremely sleep satiated... I'm going to start nodding off. Uh, and also the opposite. If I'm in something that's really engaging, I am staying awake even when I wish I wasn't. 
Uh, this is one of the ways that I now hack my wake up morning routines. I jump onto, <laughs> I jump onto our Discord and read some of the channels that I find more intellectually engaging, <laughs> just because I'm like, oh sweet, this is all this cool stuff I'm picking up on now. But uh, you could say outrage porn too. I'm not sure if that's what you outrage porn sometimes. <laughs> I was just, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, I, I want, I hate admitting to watching outrage porn ever, but it, it does sometimes happen, especially when I'm trying to wake up. Well, you know, if it's if it's intellectually fueled outrage porn like you can find on the Beijing Conspiracy Discord, I, I can't say. That that's a vibe okay but yeah i'll like oftentimes i like having a book that's kind of not all that engaging to read at night because it helps engage my thought processes so they aren't thinking about very interesting things and i start to drift away and sometimes this really backfires on me like when i decide i'm going to start reading worth the candle and then i realize it's 4 a.m and i have to wake up in a few hours and i shouldn't have started reading worth the candle because holy shit this thing is good uh You've had that feeling too when you're playing like a really a game you're really into, right? Oh yeah. And then the sun comes up and you're like, "Holy shit!" And you're just kicking yourself. That happens mm -hmm. way too often. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's been a while since I've seen the sun come up when I was playing games, but uh, it has been where it's like, "Fuck, it's midnight," and I still got to shower and stuff and go to bed. Like, yeah, that that uh, you're right. There, there is the boredom thing is is interesting. Um, you know, I've. I've seen people fall asleep in situations where they're like, they probably wish they hadn't, like movies. Um, you know, you paid 13 bucks to go to a movie and you fall asleep five, 10 minutes in because you're tired. Um, or because it's a shitty movie. The Maybe. only time I've ever fallen asleep during a movie was Transformers 3. Hmm. I won't tell Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, I, oh, it sorry. So oh, it's so long. The worst place to fall asleep, which I have done multiple times, is in a fucking work meeting where you don't really have anything <laughs> to do. You're just there and and nothing's actually happening. Yeah, and you People can't... are saying words, but they don't mean anything. Yeah, and you can't fall asleep in the meeting because it looks bad, but how the fuck do you stay awake? It's horrible. It's... I used to have that problem in school. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought what, what, what I thought you were going to say when you said the worst possible place to fall asleep is behind the wheel of a yeah. car. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I thought yeah. that too. <laughs> well, because driving is extremely boring. It yeah. It really can be, yeah. So that's that's dangerous. Yeah, so you know th that's the sort of thing, too, where it's like... I. I it's almost like saying again. This this sort of works with the same sort of analogies. Like if you if you get drunk a lot, you get really good at managing being drunk, hmm. right? Like you do develop alcohol tolerance. You develop tolerance, but also you're like, okay, yeah, I know that if I get you know this kind of woozy, I'll go do this, and you kind of get like coping strategies, maybe yeah, that yeah. you're able to recall even whilst inebriated. Speaking from experience, yeah. And I I, I I'm not luckily, but I I suspect that at some point too, you're able to talk yourself into saying. Okay, I know that when I'm drunk, I'm a bad driver, but I compensate for that by doing these these th three things, right? Uh -huh. um, uh, I I wouldn't want someone to do that while drinking. I also wouldn't want somebody to train themselves to be a really good driver while being really tired. Yeah, um, I think you put that in the notes, or was that from the was that from the post? It's from the post as well. Oh, that's nice. Okay, good. So he does put that in admonishment in there. Well, he that... doesn't put it exactly like this, but he says um, one of the objections he's received is that. Uh, driving while dangerous is well driving while sleepy <laughs> is dangerous and he said yes i agree this is bad <laughs> don't operate heavy machinery while you're sleepy fair enough yeah um anyway fun thought for fun fun thought provoking post yeah. and uh if you want a rigorous rebuttal um we'll link to natalia's uh rebuttal well speaking of fun thought provoking posts let's get to our usual less wrong posts brilliant segue yeah we've got evaporative cooling of group beliefs and when none dare urge restraint. So evaporative cooling uh, starts with uh, when cults receive some kind of major shock, like, you know, their prophecy of the world is going to end in... What was the last one that they had? It was like, what, uh, 2012 or something? Oh, the... Wasn't there the some Mayan kind of calendar Mayan? or something? Yeah. yeah. I think that was 2012. I had God, an that was so long ago. I had just an excellent apocalypse party. Hmm. <laughs> but there wasn't any religion that based their their beliefs on the apocalypse coming in 2012, was there? Um, I don't know if it was religion or just basically cultish, you know. There was some religious end of the world thing recently, though. You're right, in the last decade. I can't remember what it was, though. Yeah. Hmm. Well, anyway, um, when cults or, you know, religions receive this kind of major shock, uh, they often come back stronger than before with increased belief in fanaticism, which, you know, he Seems... also mentions, like, the you find out, like, the founder of your cult is like fucking 12 year olds or something oh or, well i mean that, that, or that too. Yeah. some people are like well as long as god's speaking to him whatever but yeah sometimes you just find out that he was a sci-fi author who liked to make shit up and thought that he could <laughs> make more money by making a religion that's oddly specific <laughs> <laughs> that's scientology 
The conventional interpretation of this phenomenon is based on cognitive dissonance, because they can't possibly admit they were mistaken, so they have to find reinforcing thoughts to counter the shock, and therefore incentivized to become more fanatical. But Eliezer has a different interpretation. Yeah. Do you want to... Sure. He says, you know, that that's the conventional interpretation, but like... When you actually see this happen to groups, who gets fed up and leaves first? Is it an average cult member? Or a relatively skeptical member who previously might have been acting as a voice of moderation? A break on the more fanatical members. So when a major shock like that happens, the people who are already kind of on the, hmm, I'm not sure quite how, you know, how much to believe this, uh, this alien pyramids thing, are like, wow, this is, this is total craziness, and I'm, I'm leaving, guys. Peace out. Yeah. And so the group itself, the people that are left, are uh, more fanatical and um, more more zealous by, on average, and which is where the analogy to evaporative cooling comes from, because that is the same kind of concept where the highest energy particles get ejected, and so the total total energy left in the puddle or whatever it is is lower. I can't remember what a, Bo- a Bose-Einstein condensate is, and I don't know why I kept referring to it, because this works perfect. The analogy also works perf- perfectly fine for a spoonful of hot soup. Yes. And so, <laughs> I don't know why he didn't need to invoke Anything a, that evaporates. A, right. He didn't need to invoke a, 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 an esoteric form of matter. Um, yeah, the idea that, yeah, the, the, the fast particles have an odd of reject, have a chance of, re- of ejecting from the rest of the, the collection, mm-hmm. and that's where steam comes from with soup. Mm-hmm. And the fun fact of, like, when you blow over it, you create a lighter uh, or like a less, a slight pressure vacuum behind your breath that you're blowing over your your soup spoon with, right? Mm-hmm. And that's why blowing on it cools it down. Mm-hmm. Like there, there's an actual intuitive understanding of why that works. Um, I also have an evaporative cooler, which is awesome. And it literally just um, is a reservoir of water with a fan that blows over it. And as the water evaporates, it lowers the temperature. So it works as a really cheap air conditioner. Quite really effective cool. too. Huh. Yeah, it... Anyway, the um, the analogy is so perfect, and I think it's because it's just so ingrained. And now, you know, I don't know when I first read this, but now I've seen this a few times. And it's like, this is just the perfect thing to point at because it's like, oh, I've seen this before. Okay, yeah. Um, this is, isn't this kind of like how all, at least all online social groups seem to be? I was thinking fandoms. Or fandoms, yeah. They fandoms tend to too. always get more extreme in one direction or another over time because the people who aren't extreme are like, Jesus, fuck this. I- I'm leaving. So there's there's an important uh, like consideration for that in this post hmm. um, that this this is why it's important one reason that it's important to to be prejudiced in favor of tolerating dissent mm-hmm. right you know so I was out of the loop because I'm not on the Discord that much but our guest uh, Cornelius from the last episode was on the Discord a couple of times and didn't didn't enjoy their experience because I think the first time they were pretty much hassled and that sucks mm-hmm. I don't know what happened the second time but uh, we don't even have to recap it because you know I wasn't there most listeners weren't there but point is is that if they were ejected because it's like you know what we don't like you get out mm-hmm. which i don't think is what happened uh, uh in, in no both times that did not happen uh he left of his own volition okay well i think the first time there was some kind of bullying involved which i totally get that is basically ejecting them but um long story short uh whether we're monarchists or not or whatever positions <laughs> and there are some things that are so intolerable that you say look no we're not we're not hanging out with this but i don't think he was that um anyway uh you keep dissenters around yeah you know if uh if if your friends are all if if your friends all have your same beliefs you need more friends yeah. right yeah. or at least need different friends um uh, it's it's valuable this this is why I like you know, and related but it's if you can't imagine if you're sitting there and you're saying i can't imagine why anyone would believe this very common belief and it's like then you're not then you need to meet more people yeah um, i have a i have a fairly tolerant uh kicking policy on our discord and i mean it's it's basically for this reason uh, i had forgotten that this post exists i must have just really internalized it <laughs> but i i want to not let it descend into a place that's extremist in any particular direction and so yeah you know sometimes there's people that i just really can't stand and i'll put them on ignore personally or something but i i don't want to kick them out of the server unless something more radically bad happens it's interesting because i mean this this uh admonishment to remember to keep people with dissent around doesn't really say how to solve that problem no right you know if you find some people objectionable it it really just does take a handful of of active keyboard people to ruin an entire online community i try to keep people around who have uh dissenting positions even extremist dissenting positions but as long as they're kind of like still civil yeah civil or even better than civil like 
still able to have fun, to be kind of jokey, to treat other people as humans, that's that's a big thing for me. Like, I can really strongly disagree with Wes on some things, but Wes always kind of makes a joke out of it and pokes fun at me or whatever, and I do the same thing back. And then it's fine, because you know what? We disagree, but we're still recognizing each other's humanity. Yeah, we're all friends here. Yeah. You know, even if... It, that's the thing, is some people come in with, like, a very fanatical... Yes. Like... When this is the most important thing in the world to me. And it's like, this really shouldn't be the most important thing in the world to anybody. But when people have no humor or start, you know, joking about busting out guillotines and killing people, I'm like, yeah, no, that's, that's, you, you don't belong here, man. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a time and a place for a good beheading joke. <laughs> and, you know, it can be funny. You mm-hmm, know, it, mm-hmm. it, it was a thing in Method Rationality. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, like, I really thought you were about to lay one down. Oh, I wish. I can't think of anyone I would like to line up and behead right now um people who ruin online communities now yeah uh, <laughs> but yeah it i don't i'm rambling someone jump in um yeah sure t even though uh eliezer said you know the in the post the thing about um keep people around when even uh when you want to eject them uh he did say in the footnote it's the artic- articulate trolls that you should be wary of ejecting on this theory they serve the hidden function of legi- legitimizing less extreme disagreement but you should not have so many articulate trolls that they begin arguing with each other or begin to dominate conversations. Yeah, that's how you get someone approaching a community, like opening the door and then just turning around and slowly walking away. <laughs> <laughs> imagine if you got on the Discord and it was just like, oh, I'm trying to imagine, like, I don't know, conspiracy theorists uh, yelling mm-hmm. with like monarchists yelling back at them and then the, you know, wire headers. A little bit like, uh, you know. Well, here's our take. I don't know. I yeah. think I would just be like, oh, whoa, all right. Uh, finding a different Discord. <laughs> yeah, I actually know somebody in real life that that, that was their experience on our server, which, you know, is pro- might be an outlier, oh, yeah. but uh, so, uh, let's check back in. He ends with a counterpoint. Mm-hmm. So Thomas Kuhn believes science has to have a paradigm, which is um, part of it is shared technical language that excludes outsiders before it can get any work done. Um, and that you know science can only make progress as a technical discipline once it abandons the requirement of outside accessibility and scientists working in the paradigm assume familiarity with large cores of technical material in their communications which i think um we kind of talked about before like with regard to the way we use jargon in the yeah. lesser community yeah. where it it can be alienating for outsiders um so it's it's but it also does let you just say that's you know that's an omega or like yeah the shelling point is yeah. yeah. So, sometimes yeah. the alienation is a feature, not a bug. Right. And I think that's what Thomas Kuhn is advocating for here. And certainly, you know, you save yourself a lot of time if you're not crossing the inferential thousand miles every time you're emailing a, a, a coworker about whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. First, um, let me tell you about meditations on Malik. Right. <laughs> so I, I see the point there. You know, I think that I, I don't know the full point Kuhn was making or where it was made, but like. Oh, he wrote the book Paradigm. Oh, okay. Well, I since I haven't read it, I don't know what point he's making in it, but the, the, what I was going to say is like, as long as you're not saying science needs to be excluded to outsiders, you know, all the time, fuck them. Then like, fuck those outsiders. As long as you're not saying that, then I'm on board with it. I think the idea is like, you know, we have the inner circle where we all talk the, our shared jargon language, but we still have, you know, the entry level area where people can come in and learn the jargon and then join the community. Right. Yeah. I mean, yes, I think we're in a, or we personally in the Denver area are kind of in a weird situation where sometimes outsiders join and they don't know the jargon and they aren't comfortable and then they leave again immediately. And like, I think Bayesian rationalism has the on-ramp of basically the methods of rationality as the, the largest one. And and the sequences. The sequences too, but the sequences are so fucking long that you can't point people at them. It, it Yeah, actually, um, when I first... At some point, uh, Eliezer linked to the sequences when I was first reading Methods of Rationality, or I think it was actually like in the beginning. It's like if you want to learn everything, mm-hmm. there used to be that little disclaimer, or yeah, intro that was like if you want to learn everything Harry knows, come over here. Mm-hmm. And I remember at one point clicking on it and being like, "Uh, there's a lot of math in this. I'm gonna set this aside for now." And then I had to come back to it quite a bit later and like it's a couple of dedicate encyclop- time <laughs> yeah it's a couple encyclopedias worth of text it's not exactly light reading yeah and if you're not into harry potter fanfic or eliezer's particular style of uh fiction and humor then that's going to be a hard sell like i i think on one hand this is a feature it keeps the community more tightly um focused on this sort of semi-autistic 
people like <laughs> us who are really into this thing and select it naturally. So I don't know how much we should focus on outreach, but obviously if we're trying to raise the sanity waterline of society in general, we're going to need some sort of on-ramp kind of thing, like when churches have open house Sundays or whatever that anyone can come to that is much doesn't talk nearly as much about, you know, the hardcore beliefs that uh about Xenu and the volcano and talk more about things like your your fate and loves or whatever. Loving your neighbor and Yeah, you know, yeah, loving your neighbor, yeah. that's right, that's right, yeah. But but not lusting your neighbor. No that's a, that's a sin. But yeah. loving them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I I know what you mean. It's uh luckily there are parts of the community that focus on that sort of thing specifically, right? Mm-hmm. So are there? Uh, I mean there's uh um I don't know if CFAR has like specifically outreach as a goal, but like how how to operationalize making this stuff stick is something that they work on. I know yeah, EA CFAR's has probably this. the most outreach. Yeah. Also some podcasts like Judah Galef's podcast, rationally yeah. speaking, that seems to be aimed much more at a general audience. Yeah. yeah. Than ours is. All right. Okay. I think uh I think we're good on that one. Yeah. Then uh the next post was when none dare urge restraint. This uh, is the post where he calls the 9-11 hijackers brave heroes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just, I thought Trigger of that. Trigger warning. I, <laughs> I listened to that on the drive over this post and I was like, man, someone could uncharitably summarize this post that way. And obviously it'd be like the most uncharitable, you know, take ever. Mm-hmm. But, uh, that, but luckily that, no one has, I don't think. If they have their ideas and no one's heard them. So it's, but, not, it's not a legitimate criticism. Yeah. I mean, it was one of the first things that um, Sam Harris brought up, right? Was that a lot of people called it hijackers cowards but they aren't this was like close after 9-11 yeah uh, i think the end of faith came out in like 2003 you're right um give or take a year so yeah i mean that that's that's the thing is you know i, I think in another post down the road somewhere eliezer is like if someone describes the terrorists as like or the taliban as like you know people with bat wings who spit acid like you're not allowed <laughs> to disagree with them because that's a favor you know that's favoring the enemy right yeah and things got about that stupid so um, they did he, yeah, he points out basically, you know, everybody hated the 9-11 hijackers and for good reason. But also uh, it immediately became the case that anyone who attacks the enemy is a patriot. And whoever tries to dissect even a single negative claim about the enemy is a traitor. Uh, <laughs> God, this, this post feels prescient. He also says it's just too dangerous for there to be any target in the world, whether it be Jews or Hitler, about whom saying negative things trumps saying accurate things. And I mean, don't. This is just this thing we see all the time nowadays, right? If yeah. someone says something bad about someone that is hated, you can't correct them and say, actually, this person is terrible, yes, but the thing you just said isn't true. Because then they're like, oh, you're defending a racist, or oh, you're defending whoever, uh, you are as bad as them. Some corners of the web are are terrible, and like it's like they're trying their best to be like an example of this sort of mentality. <laughs> yes. And it's like, I couldn't, I couldn't write a story with characters in it they're doing a better job than you guys are you know if if uh i don't i didn't watch dave Chappelle's last couple of specials but apparently he made some jokes that were uh not well liked amongst uh trans activists uh, at least some of them he says some transphobic shit sometimes yeah okay. and I, I think that's his thing you know well not that's not that's not <laughs> thing, but that, that's, 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 that's a all thing. he does that, that's a thing he does but i think that and I, again i haven't seen the special and so I'll, I'll watch it eventually, so no one needs to correct me. But let's say hypothetically that the version of what I heard was true, that something like he had said, like, there's one group you're not allowed to make fun of anymore, and that's trans people. And then he proceeds to prove his point by making fun of trans people. Mm. Um, like, he, so he, he, he <laughs> I think he, that he is tell- actually, like, how the jokes start, yeah. Yeah, so, so he tells some jokes about it, and then he's like, and then he, you know, he predicts in advance, y'all are going to get mad about this. Then they get mad. Like, I think he was kind of doing that performatively. Okay. Um, so, you know, if if someone were to be like, you know, Oh no, good example, JK Rowling actually. Yeah. Um, you know, cuz she said some stuff that is objectionable and some stuff that's like, okay, yeah, I can I can kind of see your point, I disagree with it. Mm-hmm. But if you were you're talking with somebody who's like she's the worst, she's set trans activism back by a century. Mm-hmm. Um, she's literally sacrificing trans people in her basement like and you're like, actually, she just said that she thinks that sometimes gender segregated bathrooms are nice to have if you're a woman who's trying to get away from a guy. Um, and you take the classical definitions of those two groups of people, yeah. um, then they could, you know, someone could lose their mind at you, right? Right. Uh, it's you. You have now been defending someone that is evil. Yeah. I. So this was literally a thing that happened to me earlier this morning before you guys got here. <laughs> uh, not rolling. Someone else. There. Uh, apparently, there was this publisher of horror fiction which would just take whoever, and there was a guy who supposedly wrote 
a racist novel about when white people get wiped off the earth due to some virus that targets only white people, right? I, that is literally all I know about it. Turns out that's literally anybody knows about it because the book was never published. <laughs> because as soon as it came out that some white guy wrote a book about the white race being wiped off the earth, uh, he was, I don't know, called a horrible white supremacist and the publisher uh, had all their authors that they have signed pull out from them. And the publisher said, well, we can't publish anymore. We're, we're folding. And Dang. Right. You know, all this happened in the course of a few days. And I was like, I was talking to someone on just this private discord between us and a few other friends. And I'm like, I I tried to look for something about this book, but I couldn't find like what the objectionable, con- objectionable content was. What did, what did he actually say in this book? And that's when I found out the book had never been published. It was pre-canceled because of uh, the, the back cover where they find out that the... the the, when sci-fi twitter found out that that was the premise and i'm like okay you know maybe it was racist it sounds like it certainly could have been a setup for a really racist book it sounds uh, like I'm it's not, kind of the opposite yeah, actually. I'm, not, I'm not saying it wasn't racist but how does anyone know if they've never even seen the book and he was like well that sounds kind of racist like he didn't say that but the implication in the reply was i was defending a white supremacist by saying this and Maybe he's a white supremacist, so maybe technically I'm defending him somehow. But, like, I think my point stands that nobody knows what's actually in this book. And uh, you can't just go around saying this book supports white supremacy if you haven't even read it. Especially when the description sounds like, like I said, the opposite. The entire, like, all white people die. And they're like, he's a white supremacist. Like, <laughs> I kind of, wait. That's what? what I was going to double check on. Did I mishear something? Because that sounds white inferiorist. Uh, I that, believe that on, he... only the whites died of this virus, and it's like okay, so they they were weaker than everyone else. Part of the summary uh, says that uh, the world descends into chaos. Well, white people are a large part of the population. <laughs> I would imagine yeah. if you just did eliminate any significantly large par- portion of the population, then yes, things would descend into chaos. But the implication that they were that the complainers were picking up sure. about was that white people are wiped out and therefore the lesser races can't cope and so the world ascends into chaos. I totally get how that's that's the interpretation they're going for, but I'm just yeah. imagining if I snap my fingers and you know, all the white people in the United States teleported to the moon. Right, right. Like that's like what it's more than half 50, the population. Yeah, about fifty, sixty something percent. Yeah. It's like, yeah, every you know You remove half the population of any nation and it's gonna fucking fall apart. Yeah. So I guess I don't know the thing this book sounds like it might have been interesting. Yeah, you maybe. Know, what, is the, what, is, what does the societal collapse look like? Like, I literally know nothing about the author. Maybe the other things he published have been really racist and stupid or whatever. I, I don't know. Yeah. But also, nobody knows what's in the book. Maybe, maybe it's the dumbest version ever. Yeah, and it is just like, and look, no one else could pick up the pieces because, you know, only only white people knew how to do it. Hmm. If it's that, then it's like, great, then this guy wrote a shitty book. Right, right. Um, but, but if it is just like, and look, society collapsed, and he made it white people that died instead of any other group because that would have been, you know, mean. You know, look, this only killed, uh, you know, Hispanic people. All right. Then he would have gotten canceled for that. Maybe. Right. Who knows? So he, he picked the safe race to get rid of. Yeah. And it turns out it wasn't safe enough. <laughs> yeah. Although I, I do have to say it is kind of dumb that it would only target white people because there's no, yeah. you know, scientific like, separations between races. Yeah. But also, yeah, like, I wish that they had just, even if it was racist, I wish that they would have published it so we, we could all make fun of it. Yes. It would have been hilarious. <laughs> save the Pearls was hilarious. <laughs> your comment here remember when this wasn't everyone everywhere all the time <laughs> yeah. people talk this way about like conservatives and stuff too mm-hmm. and you know not to use the some of my best friends are conservatives defense but some of my best friends are conservatives yeah, yeah. um really just i don't know i have like all of five friends and one of them is conservative um but you know he's a groomsman at our wedding he was you know he's chill as fuck we go way back and uh you know it i, I don't know it's it can happen from the other side, too, you know? If you're in a deeply conservative community and you say something about, like, well, I think the liberals have a point about this thing, and then they'll be like, the fuck are you talking about? Oh, 100%. kind of hippie-loving commie sympathizer? Yeah, this is something that people need to keep in mind that, like, I think it's because we're left-leaning, and we being basically every listener and basically every co-host here, like, yeah. that we talk about this like it's a problem on the left, because it is, but it's a problem on the right, too, it's just that we're not over there watching. Yeah. But... Like, Jeff Foxworthy put out some new special. Mm. I don't know if you watched his stuff 20 years ago. It was kind of funny. I remember his You Might Be a Redneck jokes. That's Those are the that's, ones, yeah. yeah the I, I never I saw one of his specials, though. He, 
did like I watched the blue collar comedy tour. I think they did two or three of those. And it was him and three other comedians. Oh my god, who was the guy who always had the whiskey? Supposedly uh, Ron White. Ron White. He yeah. I loved Ron White. He was hilarious. I had like this disenchanting moment with him. Oh no, what happened? Uh, well, I mean, it's it's just it's just comedy. But mm-hmm. he his joke about how he got thrown out of thrown out of a bar in New York City and the tater salad joke. Mm-hmm. I saw some older version of that, and he said I got thrown out of I got thrown out of a bar in Las Vegas. Yeah. and I'm like, oh, so. Is any of the story true? Oh. You just changed the city. So again, that was my, that's, have it was hardly s- a traumatic moment. Have you seen but... Nanette yet? No. It is, it's a stand-up comedy special, but it also kind of lets you see behind the curtains of how comedy works. Mm. And part of the thing is all comedians, I don't want to use the word lie, but change the actual facts of things that happen so that it's more funny because that's their fucking job. Yeah, they're not totally. biographers. They're yeah. just trying to make funny jokes. But it's also like deeply like fucked up and moving the things that actually happened to her it's it's an amazing bizarre kind of combination documentary slash stand-up special slash whatever i don't know what to call it exactly what was this called nanette n-a-n-e-n-e-n-e-t-t-e and it was on netflix it's probably still on netflix Perfect. it was really good i it was thought. on the netflix yeah. all right i have it searched for now That's <laughs> hannah That's gatsby so Nanette. is that the one yeah <laughs> perfect I'll watch it. Um, yeah, no, no. It, this was like when I was a kid, and I was like, wait, I thought this was a true story. Okay. But as it is, like, you know, comedians I've seen down the road, I've seen earlier versions of their stuff, and it's great because then you see, like, the unrefined version. Yeah. You know? And then you see the version that, like, you found, like, on Spotify or whatever and really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, that's what it looks like after some polishing, right? Mm-hmm. And they're like a kernel of truth there, but the point is they're making funny jokes. Yeah. Anyway, comedy's great, and I brought this up because, oh, uh, um, the redneck guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy. Foxworthy. He had a new special this year. Okay. And I haven't seen anything that... I don't even know he was still doing stuff for the last 15 years. Oh, did he get canceled by the right or something? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, okay. I, I thought that's I where you were going. I didn't see the new special. No, he, he did, like, some, like jokes about like snowflakes or like trigger warnings like back in my day we had this and i i didn't see the special but someone was telling me about this mm-hmm. and i was like that's actually from what i recall like perfectly on brand for his kind of humor i don't know if you saw his stuff from like 2002 but that's what he sounded like is mm-hmm. you know back in my day that's, that's <laughs> that was his whole thing that's, that's always like his been character, his thing right? okay yeah. that's cool. his character yeah and so i don't know what his jokes were but it was a similar sort of vibe where it's like i don't know if he was actually being offensive or if literally the people who are watching and complaining about it just literally weren't alive when he was making jokes before, <laughs> right. and have, have aren't, aren't familiar with his brand of humor. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not I'm not saying it's a good special. I haven't seen it, but I'm just saying, yeah. you know, it exists. It exists. Okay. The, the, so, yeah. Yeah. Once restraint becomes unspeakable, no matter where the discourse starts out, the level of fury and folly can only rise with time. Yes. Yeah. That's why I like being called out my bullshit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. We did have a third one to cover, but I don't know how much we want to cover in here. The Robber's Cave Experiment. Yeah. There wasn't much to cover because it was the CEO of This post was disemboweled by the replication crisis. That was me, yes. <laughs> uh, we're all familiar with the Robber's Cave Experiment. If we're not, we can go read this post. But also, it turns out that uh, it was highly manipulated by the people running it. Uh, it was the second time they tried this experiment. because Second or third? Because the first time, it didn't give them the results they wanted. And I, I don't trust anything from this experiment due to that fact you mean you can't extrapolate something about all humans from 22 11 year olds from ohio or whatever (laughs) especially not when they are being manipulated by adults into doing exactly what the adults want them to do like i I think it it's really good evidence that uh an adult can manipulate an 11 year old (laughs) into hating another 11 year old but that's that's all i'm really willing to say about it i like to imagine just like that they the third trial that they got this one they leaned in like that kid over there called you fat <laughs> and like, you know, like that that's how they kicked off the beefs right yeah the point is like you know you get outgroup hostility mm-hmm. and you can unite against a common enemy yeah those things i think you don't need an experiment to verify but i actually would be curious to see like this experiment done correctly with pre-registered hypotheses and whatnot well or or like a, an analysis of like historical um catastrophes or or you know we've got two neighboring nations that hit each other and then alexander the great comes pummeling in did they team up against him or did they fight each other to death and let him walk in and win yeah. i have no idea yeah. some historian could look at it and be like actually no his, what really happens is people tend to rip each other apart even while they're being eaten alive i was gonna say right? from what i know of history it's like not clear cut sometimes they yeah. do unite sometimes they don't and yeah it would be interesting to see what factors are there yeah i guess what i'm saying is that i i doubt the ability to test this really well in the like under controlled conditions but you can probably get some strong inferences from real life but i do like the the post ends with a uh you know he, he uses super villain i liked i think this was in sam harris's book because he brought it to mind that he's he talks about the similar phenomena he might have even cited robber's cave but 
he had said that like barring attack from outer space, there's nothing that can unite all of humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, Yuzukowski says we need a supervillain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good work. But good work. Yeah, the the you know one of the I don't know if I would even call it a finding of the study. It's something people already knew is that if you have a common enemy, people will unite against that common enemy. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. That's when I was going to mention Led Tasso, but I have to wait, so, uh, okay. yeah. Okay. Not there yet. I just ended it with Ozymandias did nothing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> You're saving the world, man. Yeah, that's right. And we were talking about Watchmen as a It's not the uh, yes. less strong poster. <laughs> Although, <laughs> Although, also... They didn't do anything wrong, either. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> In fact, they did quite a good number of posts. Oh, we should talk about some Ozzy posts sometime. Anyway. Yeah, I'm <laughs> down for that. Super into it. Cool. All right, so for next time, we are reading the Less Wrong Posts, Every Cause Wants to Be a Cult, and Reversed Stupidity is Not Intelligence. <laughs> Love that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's all we have for you today, but we do have one other thing we always do, which we are going to do now. Right. We always have time, every episode, to give a huge shout out to this episode's favorite patron. We love you all, but this week we love Joshua Davis a little more than everyone else, because it's your turn for your shout out. So thank you, Joshua. Big high five. You keep the lights on around here. We're going to get new mics as uh part of our upgrade stuff here and now it doesn't cost us money it's it comes from generous comes from the generous support of listeners like you that's right we hope to uh generously have you unfrozen in the future if you have joined us for that if you haven't you know maybe consider it that'd be great and make sure you're getting the appropriate amount of sleep whatever that might be yes exactly (laughs) (laughs) love it you guys (laughs) i don't don't know how to tie in anything else but you know we did a pretty good job i think so yeah all right (laughs) All right. Good night, everybody. See you. Good night. I don't know when you're listening to this. Good night (laughs) and good luck. Exactly. Farewell. (laughs) Bye. Bye.